has something to share and either wisdom, story, or logic. And it's clearly amazing to hear all the different missing links discovered by people unique to their own journeys and then how they have come to discover them. Together, we can help to build a bigger picture for a better future, for a brighter tomorrow. Let's stand united. Let's remove the veils and let's create a new world together. Are you that missing link? Join Jesse Hale on the Missing Link Talk Show as he helps to unveil the mystery through the unique wisdom and store of others. Three, two, one. Welcome, 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 welcome everybody here back to The Missing Link. Um, today we're excited to have back on for the second time um, Jason Breshares from Archaics.com. Um, how are you doing today, brother? Man, I'm doing, I'm doing fantastic. I'm doing good. Awesome. We had you on The Missing Link uh, a few weeks ago. Um, we started to get into our conversation and then you had a, a power outage and you weren't... Uh, we weren't able to get back on, so we're really happy that you know we were you're able to make this time for us here again today. Yeah, it's uh, I live way out in the boondocks, brother Jesse. It's it's uh, nothing but a bunch of pine trees out here, man. And Wi-Fi isn't real great. So maybe why don't you start off uh, again, um, telling us about yourself? You know, just in case there's people maybe watching this here, you know, hearing you for the first time if they didn't get a chance to catch uh, the, the the first time around. Well, uh, I'm really just a a simple guy with a a lot of data running through my head, and I share it freely. And I'm I'm, I'm approaching about 300 videos, probably. 250 of them or 260 of them are, are basically uploads, which is just my research, research findings on different mathematical um, discoveries about history, the anomalies of the ancient world, my, uh, my take on many of the mysteries throughout antiquity and in the modern world and how they can pretty much be all summed up together in this new idea that's that in the last 100 years that has really taken over some profound minds simulation theory is not new it's not something that just you that just appeared on youtube it's it, it's very intelligently discussed in the 80s in the 60s uh it was left alone during the during, during the uh, great wars periods but uh, it, it first shows up in modern times around 1899 to 1904, 1905, where uh, Gurdjieff, P.D. Alspinsky, and others were already entertaining the idea that we live in some type of artificial construct. And uh, they didn't call it a simulation 100 years ago because the computer had not yet been invented. They were using whatever frames of reference were readily available at the time. So to them, it was a mathematical construct, which basically what a simulation is. So uh, what I do is I, is, is I try to find all these things that are anomalous and mysterious throughout antiquity in our history and, and show you that, look, there is a patterning here. This patterning is indicative of artificiality. Therefore, these are not random events. And if we if we follow the evidence through the chain of custody as we have received it, then the ultimate conclusion must be that we live in a scripted artificial reality where we have a lot of freedom to do what we want to do inside of this construct, but the construct is real. It is there. It's heading in a certain direction, and it's made up of events that are already going to occur no matter what we do. But where we're going to be in our coordinates inside this construct has everything to do with us on the personal level. So basically the whole theme to my, my, my channel is that uh, you're living in two different realities. One is for the collective and one is for the individual. And your daily life reflects this. In your greatest moments as a human, you are basically your own little universe doing what you want to do. And you're projecting into the creation. But on your worst days you are basically a part of the herd. And once you're a part of the collective, you suffer everything the collective does. And it basically kills the spirit in those temporal times. You live in both realities at the same time. It's a it's a tug of war. And it's gonna it's always going to be. You're never gonna live in one and not the other. So do you believe that we're like manifest manifestors and creators of our own reality here? 
uh, I believe that a construct was provided for us to do exactly what you just described in the personal level, but we're in a construct, and that means that there are some things that, that you're not going to be able to do. Uh, you're not going to be able to just create infinitely and build up. You're not. We're finite creatures. We are basically in a containment field. That containment field has restrictions. Inside the perimeters of this holography, you have great latitude to do whatever you want to do and, and be who you want to be. But as uh, I have... I have I have messages that some people don't resonate with because there are a lot of people who believe that we can change the world. We can do all these things. I don't believe at all that we were meant to change the world. I believe that we were meant to be changed by the world. It is totally inverse to, to the popular notion. Um, and I, and I show my studies, I show, I reveal why I believe these things that uh, actually my, my end message is, is actually one of hope, but in order, in order to, basically understand the particulars of the light that I'm trying to reveal, you have to go through the dark. You have to peel the shadows back and understand what we're looking at. So I don't, I don't believe in, in the we are the world scenario where we're all going to get together and, and positive thinking is going to change the world because I don't believe this construct was meant to be changed in that way. It was meant to change those that are flowing through it. So you don't think if enough people, you know, got together here and, you know, the veils were lifted and, you know, we decided to take down all the 5G towers or, you know, things that, you know, supposedly are constructs that, you know, they've put into place. But, you know, the collective decided, you know, that they didn't want some of this transhumanist stuff and you know that if enough people got together to change the game you don't think the game can be changed um yeah i love the notion i really like it but jesse i don't believe that i believe that what you're what the activity that you're talking about if it does involve a, enough people you're talking about let's let's just say let's just say 100 million people let's say 100 million people were on that mindset and they wanted to do that and they wanted to alter this the, the reality they're going to alter reality for themselves within the confines of the construct but the construct is going to continue with its protocols cataclysm protocols it's negative default programming none of that's going to be undone it's written in the construct itself the seven, the 750,000 people that do exactly what you're talking about are going to build for themselves an isolated, beautiful world within this construct. It's not going to have much contact, contact with the majority because 750 million people are still a, a, an extreme minority when you take in the entire world's population. The rest of the world will continue with negative default program. They'll continue with cataclysm protocols. And if the 750 50 million actually start undermining the construct itself the construct has fail safes built into it to prevent that further development that are called resets and we have suffered them many many times um where do you think the construct originated where did this you know whole matrix or you know paradigm that we live in where where do you think it originated well oh um, my opinion on that matter is entirely it's entirely chained to the information that that is fed to us uh, i've done deep dives in history and i sh and i show this i demonstrate it and i show that the oldest traditions and records in the world have a focus that focus is always on ancient calendar systems uh i would it's cataclysms are what you find in the traditions of the world when you when you strip away everything down to its base denominators you find that the ancients were fixated on the element of time on cycles and epicycles the creation of calendars that those calendars in the ancient world have a common denominator they all began right after a major disaster or a cataclysm so looking from one side of the, uh, of the coin this is what we see but if we look from the other side of the coin we see civilizations that were doing exactly what you just said, getting enlightened, doing all kinds of things. And all of a sudden, bam, they get they get hit with a reset from our vantage point. It's a cataclysm. It's earthquakes, volcanoes, subsidence, volcanic resurfacing. And then a new calendar is initiated until the next time this, ha this happens. Now, 
this is doomsay. I mean, this is doomsaying to a lot of people, but the whole principal message of my videos, I have many videos uh, that, that discuss this, is that in the personal, Jesse Howe, the soul, the immortal soul that is Jesse Howe is only responsible for Jesse Howe. Jesse Howe can try to change the world, but the construct itself is only, is only going is only going to be modified a modicum compared to to what the con basically the architect designed. You're you're not going to change the world, and I know a lot of people hate hearing that, but there are no there are no instances in history where the collective came together and changed the world. There are only specific instances in history when the collective came together and got fed up with something and they got hit with a devastating cataclysm in response. Now, you, know, and we, you can talk about Sodom and Gomorrah and Atlantis, uh, the, the Egypt, the collapse, the total collapse of uh, Middle Egypt and what we call in the Bible is the Exodus event. Um, we have these, but in the personal, in the personal, the message is totally different. I'm only conveying to you right now, Jesse, the collective, how the construct reacts to the collective. But in the personal, in the personal, you're immune to the protocols of the collective. You are absolutely an immortal being away. You're able to carve your own way through this existence. You can even affect the lives of others. You are a series of informed holographic fields that carry with you an information. And that information is every decision, every moral and ethical decision you've made in your life, everything you've accepted to be true, everything that you've come into contact throughout your entire life. You wear that informed field like armor and reality itself reciproc reciprocates you attract to those other you attract people and souls to you that are in resonance with you you perform acts that are miraculous to other people i'm not i mean it's really insignificant things that other people are amazed by mnemonic, mnemonic enhancement the ability for instant recall uh physical activity uh, we are always amazed by by like sports athletes that do almost things that we know that are impossible for us but they have built that informed field through physical activity and repetition and to them it's nothing it comes with no effort they just do these things the same thing with people who have memorized a lot of facts. Once you actually know a topic, it doesn't it doesn't have anything. There, there's nothing amazing about instant recall. There's nothing amazing about the ability to elucidate very complex concepts in, in base denominators in the most simplistic forms. This right here is an ability that is granted to you through your informed fields. These informed fields make you what you are and make you totally and absolutely independent of the construct that you're confined by. You're an immortal, and until you understand that you are actually independent of, of the very environment that you're trapped in right now, you remain a prisoner of that environment. And that environment will reciprocate and, and continue what I refer to as dungeon programming. Knitting for you the very experiences in your life that confirm that you're a slave or that you're a prisoner. But once you, but once you truly will awaken within and understand that you're a series of informed fields and that you're living in an avatar and this is nothing but but this human shell is nothing but a genetic avatar that is so beautifully created to hold an immortal soul once these really become a part of your informed field and you really believe these things there is nothing the outside world can do to you and you will do those things that actually shock other people. You will walk into rooms and people that are vibrating on your frequency will instantly look up and look at you having never seen you before and don't know you. You will make eye contact with people in public who are on your exact frequency. But you guys don't know. You just think it's random. You think it's random that people look at each other at the same time. It's not. When two, when two totally different strangers who have never been in physical proximity to each other actually make eye contact for the first time, it's because there is a recognition within. Those immortal souls know that they know each other. They know each other because they're on the same frequency, which means they are not vibrating. They are not in resonance with everybody else around them. Everybody else around them doesn't even, probably most of the time, doesn't even know they're there. This is why sometimes in a crowd of people, you are absolutely alone.
So do you think that that's how, you know, people were here before words that they actually, you know, were able to recognize and communicate with each other with this frequency and vibration and possibly even communicate without actual physical words being spoken? Well, Jesse, we can do that today. We're highly empathic creatures. I mean, uh, I don't know if you're referring to a uniformitarian view where where humans actually antedate uh, the ability to speak. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah. Okay, before okay. before words were put into okay. this existence. Now that that is a uniformitarian position, and I'm not a uniform uniformitarian. You will never you you will never convince me that humans did not appear in this world ex nihilo with fully functioning. Uh, vocabulary fully fully we didn't know i do not believe in the natural selection evolutionary model i have seen absolutely too much evidence otherwise that is a that is that is what has been given to us but this construct whole entire human populations appeared ex nihilo meaning out of nowhere just as we have had resets just as ha as entire civilizations have been entombed in mud in minutes and the actual human occupants have vanished just as the archaeological record has shown that these things happened instantaneously in the same way whole populations of humans throughout antiquity have been introduced ex nihilo as well i don't believe in the gradual development at all uh, the the diversity of, of races and genotypes the diversity of blood types absolutely necessitates that this world isn't what we've been taught it is this world is almost like a holographic construct where somebody is experiencing experimenting with biospheres introducing different types of humans to to to, to live out different conditions because the horror, the historical record is very clear in the traditions we see all all the fossil evidence evidence of older world systems that don't exist today. We have lived in a, in, in a total worldwide desert when there was almost no water and we adapted to it. We have lived when the world was almost all completely sheathed in ice and we survived it. We have lived, humans have lived in a completely tropical world where there was no ice in, in, at the poles at all. It, the entire world was tropical and the animals, uh, animals, insects, amphibians, reptiles grew to astonishing sizes. We have also lived, and I have many videos on, on, on this showing the scientific reports, that we have also lived under a vapor canopy like Venus has. And the conditions of our world were fundamentally different under the vapor canopy. In fact, vapor canopy traditions are, are a major theme of ancient uh, Na Native American tribes. Native Americans have the best memories and traditions about the world when the sun did not exist. It was only the moon and an ocean of water that floated in the sky, which magnified the stars and the heavens. But it was the time of the dark purple light. And it was enough ambient radiation that filtered in through this that animals, people, flora and fauna grew, grew to astonishing sizes. But uh, no, I don't believe in the uniformitarian view. Uh, I don't believe in the development. Uh, I actually, my position, Jesse, is that is that we have devolved, that when we first appeared in this world, we appeared technologically advanced with much better cognition skills, much better memory, a, a, a perfectly intact and fully fitted out infrastructure, and over resets and cataclysms, we have lost all that until about 150 years ago. And I say this all the time on my channel, it only takes us 200 years to go from horse and buggy to Hadron Collider. Taking that into consideration, if we have 58 centuries of recorded history, I don't want to trigger anybody. I didn't say history. I said recorded history. This is actual date dates on steels, on temple walls, on cuneiform tablets, uh, you know, date monikers and traditions, that we have 58 centuries of recorded history, and yet it only takes us 200 years to get, then this necessarily implies we've been technologically advanced a, a few times. And that fact is what answers many of the enigmas and mysteries that have been found in the archaeological record. Anomalous artifacts called Uparts. So do you actually believe that the dinosaurs, as they say, Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus Rex, do you believe that they, you know, were here on this earth at one time? 
uh, they lived under a certain biosphere. And we have, we have evidence from Mexico in the 35,000 artifacts that were found and excavated at Acambaro that shows anatomically correct what you're calling dinosaurs. I don't believe in the, I don't believe in the 65 million year, million year uh, KT boundary uh, crap that's been foisted upon us. We have actual terracotta figurines that have been excavated in Mexico and in Cambodia, statues that show anatomically correct stegosaurus, uh, 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 pet, uh, triceratops like you're talking about. And I don't believe the dinosaur model. I believe that those were gigantic lizards and amphibians that are, are now presently extinct. But there's nothing fantastic about them because in the archaeological record, we have already found rabbits that were 80 pounds. We have found condors that had wingspans of 40 feet. We have in the archaeological record, this is called the megafauna. Now, evolutionary biologists and uniformitarians continually put out that this was during the ice age when we had what they call megafauna. But the problem is, is that we found megafauna, which is gigantic elephants, gigantic mastodons, mammoths, three-toed sloths, possums that were six feet high and nine feet long. We're talking about anatomically correct marsupials and placentals that are identifiable 100% today by any kid who opens up a book, except the fact is they were about nine times larger in mass than they are today. This was because the biosphere then was totally different. That biosphere allowed for reptiles and amphibians to grow to astonishing sizes. Now we find these creatures all mixed together in the archaeological record, and we have this nice little packaged geological history that's foisted upon us that doesn't come with a lot of evidence. It comes with a lot, a lot of hyperbole and theory. And so I don't know. I don't believe in the dinosaurs. I do believe there were gigantic amphibians and, and reptiles. And that's only because no one can ever contend it. No one can ever say it's not true. But it's because of the megafauna. At the exact same time, we also had gigantic mammals. We had gigantic marsupials. So when everything in the world is gigantic, and when we look in the, in the coal seams that have been found all around the world, and we find the evidence of absolutely gigantic trees, mushrooms that have been petrified that are 14 feet high, still standing today, listen, if everything in the world is gigantic, then the biosphere was different. It wasn't the same biosphere. And the uh, the scientists in Glen Rose, Texas, have already proven this. This isn't anything theoretical. It's just new to your listeners. Many of your listeners have never heard these concepts, but it's not new to science. Scientists in the 1990s built a biosphere in Glen Rose, Texas, and they replicated the, the uh, vapor canopy conditions. These vapor canopy conditions they replicated instantly made fruit flies, cockroaches, lizards, amphibians grow to about three times their normal size. They also lived three times longer in the biosphere. They created, they created a new atmospheric pressure. They, they, they replicated the dark purple light that, was, that is described in, in, in ancient times. They replicated all the conditions, uh, increased the, uh, the, the nitrogen and, and oxygen in the biosphere because that's what the vapor canopy would do. The vapor canopy created a worldwide greenhouse effect. But just the sun wasn't visibly seen in the 5.5% in the of the electromagnetic spectrum that the human eye can see. The sun was there, but it was on the other side of the mesosphere which was outside the vapor canopy. So in the daytime, no one could actually point to an area of the sky and say where the sky was because the light diffraction had the whole sky a light purple. At nighttime, it turned jet black and just like the book of Genesis says, every evening and every morning, the water in the sky, the firmament, it rained on the, gr it rained on the ground as a dew and it watered all the, all, all the plants and animals. That was at nighttime. So when that condensation came down, what was left was enough water drop droplets in, in the mesosphere to magnify the heavens. Now we have now we have a gigantic ancient magnifying glass allowing the matriarchal societies that were existing before the flood to look up and see stars, patterns, and all kinds of, of luminaries that we cannot see with the naked eye today. This is the world that is painted to us in the traditions. This is the world that has been replicated in Glen Rose, Texas, inside of a scientific biosphere. So there's nothing theoretical about it. It's just that 
people have a have a hard time divorcing themselves from a paradigm by which our educational institutions have brainwashed us into believing this whole geological 65 million year crap this whole thing about fo how fossils create because there's so many different mysteries that tap into that such as fossilized jellyfish how do you petrify something that doesn't have any bones? How do you turn an earthworm? How do you turn butterfly wings into solid rock? You don't find this in high school. They're not going to tell you about this. But I have pictures. I have showed them in my videos. Actual scientific finds of flies, dragonfly wings, even a cockroach that was spread out in mid-flight. Because cockroaches have wings. Cockroach in mid-flight suddenly petrify. How do you petrify Oh. Uh, cilia the little cilia on on ferns that are underwater how is it possible the only conclusion that we can make is that the entire world was flash frozen something terrible happened the entire world was flash frozen and then once it was flash frozen over a period of centuries as it thawed out, it mineralized, because that's how a fossil forms. It, it draw all the decomposing organics actually draw in the silicates from the surrounding material. And this is why we find fossils made of every single material. But this is also why we find fossilized jellyfish. There's no way to fossilize a jellyfish in the uniformitarian model. Our high school and college books are full of bullshit. There's no way that these creatures didn't die and then turn to stone and fossilize. No comet hit the world and then turn around and, 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 and turn these fossils because the fossils that we're finding now are almost a mile down in the seabed under the ocean. So whatever caused the fossil the petrification of all the animals on the surface also turned to stone jellyfish at one mile depth in the Mar Marianas Trench. It's not possible unless the entire world flash froze. So the whole model, the whole model you're talking about is something I cannot accept. It does not go with the facts. The uniformitarian model of slow development of human speech, human development, slow development, the dinosaur model and none of that. So human skeletons have been found with prehistoric creatures in the same strata. Therefore, the whole the whole chronology that has been given to us is absolute bullshit. So I, what's your thoughts on carbon dating then? Well, carbon dating is really good until you get to the vapor canopy. Car carbon dating is basically measuring the isotopic breakdown of carbon in the atmosphere. And there's no, I have no problem with relative dating methods going back 4,000 years. They have, been, they have shown from taking multiple different samples of, of, of an area of, of organic materials and decomposed materials from an area, it has been shown over and over and over. It's very, very, very accurate even different samples that are that are analyzed in different labs from from the same you know area uh, a different artifact or whatever but once you hit that 4200 year mark to the year 2239 bc the collapse of the vapor canopy what the bible calls the great flood which the ancient nordic peoples of europe called the day the sky fell and ancient americans claimed that it began the sun calendars because when the vapor canopy collapsed then the sun was seen for the first time no one had seen the sun before that's why all the older timekeeping systems are stellar and lunar and they're matriarchal but as soon as this grand massive cataclysm happened everything from that point after is patriarchal all the matriarchies lost their power people lost their faith in them the patri patriarchal patriarchal law was instituted now the sun became a male a male uh uh, uh a figure and since since the 20 since the uh, 23rd century bc all the American systems now go by the, the water sun, then the fire sun, then the earth sun, which is which was a period of a bunch of earthquakes. It's the four sun periods. And the last period is the apocalypse. It's called the fifth sun, which is represented on the 22-ton relic called the Aztec calendar stone, better known as the stone of the fifth sun uh, that was found in uh, Mexico. Again, Mexico is very... Most people don't know Mexico has among the most ancient evidence of, of, of infrastructure in the entire world. Mex Mexico, Mexico, South America, and, and the uh, British Isles have among the most ancient buried infrastructures this world has ever seen. North America has a lot too, found in the coal seams, but I don't think it's near as old as those, the ones, I, the ones I'm mentioning. You know, there are infrastructures that, that have been found on our world that can only be seen by halo drones. 
And uh, this is by a technique called aerial, aerial archaeology. Uh, you can't on the ground see anything, but uh, aerial, aerial archaeology has isolated many, many different areas of the world where it's obvious that whole forests have grown over the, the buried remains of ancient, ancient uh, civilizations. So you mentioned, you know, giant trees and giant animals, you know, things were more giant, you know, flora and fauna, things that were here. So would there be giant humans, men and women here as well? Because we've seen evidence of staircases and these big giant uh, petrified trees. And maybe is that how the, the, the pyramids got into place by actually rather large, large men and women? Uh, I don't know if the pyra- if the Giza pyramids, which were the first, were were actually built by giants. I don't. It would it would be hard for me to believe that because uh, I have I have like thirty one videos in my Great Pyramid series, and I show that you know those those monuments weren't built the way the Egyptologists tell us. They were machined, and no giant could ever fit in the Great Pyramid. There's no entrance in the Great Pyramid that would allow for anything but a normal human-sized person to get in and out to do any of the engineering that was necessary inside the Great Pyramid. There were swivel slabs that were multiple tons in weight that allowed that allowed to be moved so people can move up and down shafts. You could hide the upper shafts from the lower descending channel, but it, oh, I don't see giants as as building. I see that the Great Pyramids of Egypt were built by machines. Now, what we do have is a phenomenon such as Catalhoyuk, Jericho, Gobleki Tipi. We have many 26th century BC communities and cities that all have the same symbols that are found in Rongo Rongo, which you know of as the area of Easter Island, the big old giant heads on the island down in the South Pacific. Okay, the same symbol system that is found in Rongo Rongo, the tablets that have been found on Easter Island are the same effigies that have been found. These are vapor canopy glyphics. They have been found all over Gobleki Tipi. They have been found in uh, uh, the ancient Nassos, the, the pre-Minoans uh, on Crete, they have been found uh, in Jericho, they have been found in, in many of these places. And the common denominator is that these places had walls and buildings that were specifically designed to keep humans away from the ground. The, the whole communities were structured where people could go rooftop to rooftop on walkway planks in ladder systems and stone arch little bridges and stuff. For some reason, humans were building communities at this time under the vapor canopy with walls that were far larger than what was necessary to keep out a human army. The walls were built to keep something else out. The walls were, uh, um, Jericho's a really prime example. So Jerusalem has evidence of uh, of ancient walls, but they're far deep. Now, many of the Near Eastern uh, cities that later became popularized, like Nineveh and Babylon, Uruk and Ur, and then in Canaan, we have huge cities like Kadesh and Ugarit and Rashamra. These cities became really popular in the second millennium BC, but the truth is every single one of them had the common denominator of massive, gigantic blocks, foundations, and, 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 and the beginnings of walls underneath the walls that were later built of smaller materials that went low when, when it was just normal humans. Really, where I'm going with, with, at this with is the deeper we go down, the larger, more megalithic the architecture becomes, as if a larger species of human was either building or humans were trying to protect themselves from a much larger species of human. So another common denominator that we find is that if you were to re- if you were to research all the ancient texts in the world, everything that we have dated from the third, second, and first millennium BC and the first millennium common era AD, if we were to just take those four thousand years and we were to strip away every single text that does not have anything to do with an epic or an, an epos, we are left with when we are confronted with a very unique phenomenon. We are confronted like the Epic of Gilgamesh, Epic of Atrahasis Epic. We are confronted with Beowulf Epic. We are confronted with Homer's Odyssey, Homer's Iliad. We are confronted with uh, uh, Works and Days by Theognis. We are confronted with writings that have one single common theme. And I have never seen another author put this out. 
but it's something I, I produced a video on this. That one common theme from the oldest writings in the world that are considered to be epics from cuneiform all the way to ancient uh, uh, Geet, Geetish, the book uh, Beowulf. The common theme is humans used to fight giants. And this is really significant because this is transcontinental. It is transcultural. This idea that humans were fighting a much larger species of humans is everywhere in, in, in our ancient writings. And not so much ancient writings. The idea continues all the way up until the Renaissance. All kinds of texts were still being composed up to the Renaissance of of gigantic humans the original the original uh, uh spanish con uh, conquistadors especially everybody knows who studied even a little bit of history about the ancient americas everybody knows about the patagonian giants the giants of south america that that uh, fernando magellan came into contact with and uh wrote uh, his, his men on ship wrote, wrote memoirs about all this it described these people but uh there are I'm not an authority on giants. I have a published book on giants, but I'm not the authority. All I'm doing is rehashing everything I found from all these ancient texts and modern authors like David Hatcher Childress, who has written a phenomenal amount of material about what has been excavated, showing that giants used to live in this world. But to but but what I the the value I bring to the to the research is basically when they were here, the chronology, because giants were here at a certain period of time that period of time in genesis is called the pre-flood world and in genesis chapter 6 we have the introduction of giants now but that was under the vapor canopy once the vapor canopy collapsed those people didn't grow to those sizes anymore they didn't shrink they were still alive they lived for hundreds of years but after the vapor canopy now the children of these titans actually became the new race of giants those born during the vapor canopy were titanic and this is what the greek myths reveal the greek the greek myths reveal that there was a race of titans that came first then there was a cataclysm in the days of chronos after after the days of chronos no more titans were born in the world but the children of the titans gave birth to the gigantes these were the, the races of the giants many of these giants got out of control and some of the titans slew them and killed them but many of them fled and the race of giants was spread over the world the titans were now considered the gods they had lived they had no beginning they had no end they were worshipped as divinities because they had actually lived in two different worlds and survived they lived under the vapor canopy and now they lived in the new sun world which was chaotic it was hot it was miserable the conditions were totally different it was really hard to find food now uh, uh, it was a totally different world when, when the vapor canopy collapsed the world after what the bible calls the great flood so when this vapor canopy had flooded the world the world didn't flood like noah's ark story where only eight people survived the flood that's that's a jewish tradition the jewish tradition is very 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 it's almost childish the actual flood traditions are worldwide every culture remembers them but they all have different versions of what happened so and the main version was was that the flood killed off the races of the giants but there was a few that remained and this is an element we find in the old testament all throughout the old testament we find that the normal sized humans that were descended from Brahma, which you know of as Abraham, Abram, those people had a problem with five races of giants. Those races of giants were the Rephaim, the Anakim, the Zuzum, the Emums, and the Zamzumums. These five races are mentioned many times in the Old Testament, and they were terrible, and other races left them alone. They were involved in, a, in an epic war, uh, and I believe it was a uh, 1867 bc i'm not don't quote me on it but it's in my chronicon but it's called the battle of kuraksada this same battle is mentioned in the mahabharata ancient ancient Ved indian hindu text so uh all of these all of these different ancient texts and all these traditions the common denominator is that this old world that was like a garden of eden world where everything under this vapor canopy was beautiful grew to lush sizes and you didn't have to farm because food was hanging from every tree so and animals were everywhere to get the only problem was was giants during this period and they couldn't have been too many or there would have been no humans that would have survived nor would have any humans been able to build infrastructures like cities so 
I believe, just like Jonathan Gray, another prolific researcher, and David Hatcher Childress, and, and many other researchers before me, we believe and we are of the opinion that when we're talking about the pre-flood world, we are talking about a society that had technology. And this is how they kept these giants at bay. They had guns. They had weaponry. They had weapon systems. And the architecture that we find is replete with evidence that it was commensurate with that technology. They had a different species of science. It was technolithic. It wasn't based off metals like today. It was based off properties of crystal and stone, like quartz. And the ability and metallurgy was only used at a bare minimum to heighten the properties of rock and stone and to magnetize their weapon systems. Their, their technology was very different. And this is why we don't understand a lot of the things we find in the archaeological record. They're, they're a mystery to us because our present day scientists are operating from very modern frames of reference. Those frames of reference are basically brainwashed into them by universities who tell them, well, you have to you have to whatever theory you come up with is good. We may even fund it. But whatever you come up with and whatever you publish, if you want to be peer reviewed and endorsed, then it needs to fit within uniformitarian principles. It must fit within the evolutionary model. It must fit within the geological ages that we have already assigned the history of the world. And it must it must fit with the uh, basically the principles of geology as put out by Charles Lyell in the 1800s the true source of the whole evolution model. Yeah, even, even Darwin doubted his own theory and published that, but you won't read that in scientific books. You have to read that in Darwin's own, own books. But he, even he said there is nothing truer than the fact that the entire history of the world is one of cataclysms and, 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 and basically uh, uh, mass extinctions. For that man to say that means that he was a catastrophist, not an evolutionist. But 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 science borrowed him. They made him as their poster child. But the real evolutionary theory was Charles Lyell. He was the he was the fuel behind behind putting that that false paradigm out. Hey, hey, hey if I'm running my mouth too much, you got to stop me. You got to stop me, Jesse. I will go off. No, I like it. We're here to we're here to hear you. So you can't talk enough here. So this is all great. And everybody, the comments are like going going wild here. So I was just gonna say that it sounds like you know the the model is you know the uh, programming one hundred and one that you know that yeah, you yeah. believe in believe in this paradigm or you know you're 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 shunned away from you know funding and everything else all the accolades that come. So what do you think the Anunnaki are and how do they, you know, uh, a, a part of our history? So anyway, um, for those who are not familiar with my research, my take on the Anunnaki is fundamentally different than almost anything you've ever heard on YouTube. And it comes with so many sources that you're going to get uh, overwhelmed. So I've provided uh, like 49 videos i have i have the anuna files videos that breaks down this history what we have we have this historical record about the anunnaki recorded by non-caucasian people with smooth skin dark eyes in the sumerian records they prided themselves as the dark-headed people this is what they called themselves and they had olive skin they had dark hair and dark eyes that was very straight and uh they all um, they were overwhelmed after a cataclysm in 34, 39 BC, which wiped out an infrastructure that was in North America. All of a sudden, fleets of Caucasians with long beards, almost like Vikings. It's almost like the Viking story all over again. They showed up. They showed up in the Delta regions of all these, all these pre-civilized areas. In the Urumbaba Valley in Peru, they showed up in the Delta there. They showed up in the Delta of Egypt the Goshen area. They showed up in fleets in the Tigris-Euphrates uh, basin in, in the Persian Gulf, the uh, the delta there. They showed up in the Indus Valley uh, of Mohenjo-Daro, Harappan civilization. They showed up in the Yangtze River uh, 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 civilization. And when they showed up, the traditions from all these non-Caucasian peoples tell the exact same story. Historians like Thor Heyerdahl went to these places and recorded all these things in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. He's a very controversial author, not because he's putting out uh, controversial information, but because we don't live in a world where 
actual facts about race can be can be can be basically be published without being called a racist. Even though the traditions are from non-Caucasian people to say that Caucasians suddenly appeared in all these ancient areas uh, and cite the original sources, cite the Melanesians, the Micronesians, the Polynesians, the ancient Hawaiians, the Ainu of ancient Japan, the the, Jim, the, the Imu, the, uh, the ancient Chinese, to, to cite all these cultures, the Sumerians themselves, the Akkadians, the early Egyptians, even the early Egyptians said their civilization wasn't what well, well, wasn't built until Means invaded, and then when you study who Means was, Manashtu, and you find out he was one hundred percent Sumerian, and there are many books from a hundred years ago by scholars who were talking about all these things. The problem is, is after nineteen o two, a whole new world structure appeared. And censored this city. The engine of censorship went into overdrive. Institutions like the Smithsonian Institute uh, went into overdrive, destroying fossils and evidence of all these things that were going on in antiquity. And all these earlier writers, these fantastic writers that were putting out, I cite them all. I do videos on them. I show their books. I open the books up, show the bibliographies. I show all these things off. Man, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating that all this data was already known in the 1880s, 1890s, all the way up until 1920, 1930. It was absolutely amazing that the history of the world had already been put together. And then World War I hit. Then the Bolsheviks took over. Then World War II came in. And then the absolute iron fist dominion of the Bolsheviks over the entire body politic of the world was exemplified for everybody in the Nuremberg trials. Once that happened in 1946, we have been controlled. All our universities, all of our media, all of our educational, all of our all of our uh, Hollywood, everything is absolutely controlled through Bolshevik filters. If you now, this is the type of material that I would like to release, but I can never release it on my YouTube channel. I will, I, I will, I will lose. I have 300 videos on YouTube, and I'm not going to risk that. I have data sets that would blow your mind about what the ancient Greeks said about these people and what these people were doing in the Mediterranean 300 years BC. The Romans were epic administrators and they've gotten a really bad rap. But the things that Roman orators like like Cicero, uh, <laughs> the, the things that, that Tacitus and Tacitus recorded about these people and predicted, even the founding fathers of America left memoirs that anybody can see in the Library of Congress today. They can't take them out. They can't edit them, but they don't draw attention to them. But if you go into the congressional records, congressional globes and congressional annals, you will find record after record of a record of what the founding fathers of America said and predicted about these people if they were ever allowed inside our borders. And then once they were allowed, they initiate, they, 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 it took them no time to use the World Banks to initiate the war between the states. They did World War I, the collapse of the Russian Romanov Christian <clears throat> Empire, they turned it into the atheist USSR. These people are the pure definition of iniquity. This is what they do. They're still in control, but the control mechanisms that they put in place are now unraveling. They're in trouble now. They're, I think they know the writing is on the wall, but they're really good at misdirection and letting other people take take the fall for the very things that they have done. But I don't know how we, we, we went off on this tangent about these people, but the, the actual question was about the Anunnaki. And when it comes to the story of the Anunnaki, we have a Caucasian infrastructure that was technologically <clears throat> advanced in, in the 35th century B.C., wiped out in the cataclysm. But they predicted it. They knew. They were scientific. They were from North America. And from North America, we have followed their migrations and where they reappeared in the ancient world. They were all in connection. This is the reason why the royal families from Egypt were absolutely allied to their now from a cultural perspective, they're, they're enemies. The Egyptian people hated the Hittites. But the higher you go up into the nobility and the, into the upper royalty, they're absolutely allied. This is why we find these mysteries in ancient cuneiform texts of kings of the Hittites paying homage to Pharaoh, his enemy, sending him daughters, sending him sons. There was an exchange of blood between Rashamra 
between the Amorite capital of Mori, between old Babylon of the Amorites, uh, uh, the Akkadian Sargon, Sargon of Akkad, the daughter of a priestess who was Sumerian and a Naitu priestess. He said, we have an exchange, a cultural exchange, but it was purely racial. This is why in the 1890s, 1910, 1920s, archaeologists were excavating uh, all these first and second dynasty Egyptian tombs. They widely publicized what they found. The same things they found in Sumerian tombs, the same things they found in ancient Canaanite tombs, the same things they found in Mohenjo-Daro, in the Harappan tombs. We have the same ruling family ruling all these ancient civilizations that if you take a, a history book today, these historians swear up and down all these nations were absolute blood enemies. And they were, and they were, according to the people, but the ruling families ruled them all. It is the exact same scenario that we are living under today. It is the exact same scenario that was hidden in after 1764, which was a Phoenix episode year. Now, we, we haven't talked about Phoenix in, in this video, but in 1764, all this political social structuring changed and all the monarchies started collapsing, but they didn't really start collapsing. All these republics and democracies suddenly appeared. The United States, 13 little measly co colonies, beat the greatest empire the world has ever seen, you know, the, the British Empire. All of this was by design. But the people are made to fight each other as if there's truly a conflict. The ruling families are only changing positions. This game has been played since the days of the Anunnaki. It's unraveling today. There is, a, there is a minority among these elite who have never played ball. They have always gotten the short end of the stick. They've been pissed about it for hundreds of years. And they, they, they I mean, I, I got videos about what's going on. And I don't want to talk about it in this video because it's going to go in so many different directions. But what I'm referring to is Vladimir Putin in Russia and what he's done with, what done with Ukraine. He has absolutely pissed off the very people who thought he was an ally. All these globalists, all these all these Bolsheviks, the, the Rothschild family, they are livid about Putin. But it's not the first time Russia did that. Russia has done that at least four times in recorded history where they fucked the other royal families because they get the short end of the stick. They're always fucked over every time. They did it in the Civil War. They did it in the American Revolutionary War. And they did it in the French Revolution. They always involve themselves when they can actually do the most damage against the royal families. This is what they do. Russia has a long history of it, long history of upsetting their plan. They are a part of those royal families, but they're like the one bloodline, the one family that just won't get along with the others. They don't play, play well with others. They're always bucking the system. So do you think that uh, these uh, families, these controlling families, are they the watchers? And they're just, you know, playing the game and pitting okay. people against each other? Or are they maybe... Off. Or is there maybe watchers that are watching, and the royal and the, the ruling families are being watched by another set of watchers that are kind of you know watching what's happening you, in, in this paradigm? I know, I know. When you say watcher, you are basically referencing the passages of the Book of Enoch, where the fallen angels are called watchers, and they gave birth to the Nephilim and the giants and all that, right? That's your frame uh, of reference. That's what you're yeah. referring to, right? No, I I never read Enoch, so I'm not. Okay. Uh, I'm not okay. sure. I'm not. I, I I I'm very limited when it comes to Bible. I didn't get a lot of the Freemason public school okay, well, indoctrination. I didn't word, get a lot of. We're Bible. using a word that is that has a lot of connotations attached to it. That's why I'm trying to clarify. When you say watcher, there is an entire there is an entire echelon of truthers that are going to assume you're talking about the references in the Book of Enoch. The fallen, the fallen angels called watchers who gave birth basically to giants, Nephilim, and created the royal families. This is this is a popular thread. All right. I'm going to address that real quick. All right. The frames of reference for the old world were not Caucasian. So when Caucasians showed up, they were called by all kinds of names that made sense to a non-Caucasian people. So they were called shining ones. They were they were called alabaster. They were always represented in Sumerian reliefs with beards and eyes that were huge. This is no different than the, the cartoon industry of Japan today. 
Have you ever seen anime? Have you ever seen Japanese anime cartoons? I, I've seen a little bit of it. Uh, my girlfriends and kids, they like it. So I've okay. seen then just, you know, just then, very, very then limited You're going to know what I'm talking about. You're going to know yeah. exactly what I'm talking about. The old statues of Gudea, of Sumer, and his wife, and other Sumerian statues of the Lugalum, which were the big men of Sumer, the common denominator is not only are they bearded, which the Sumerians weren't. These were the these were the leaders of the Sumerians, the Anuna, the and what you call Anunnaki. Now, the Anuna were always depicted with beards and these giant round eyes, the exact same way that Oriental people depict Caucasians today. In cartoons, in pictures, in iconography, and in statuary, anytime somebody in the Orient is, is referring to white people, they always give them these overly large eyes. This is a cultural trait. It goes back 5,000 years. Nothing has changed from the statues of ancient Sumer all the way to the artistic cartoon depictions that are on your child's cartoon today. The exact same thing applies. This is what's called a frame of reference. This is one thing that Oriental people have always done because they identify themselves as ne as having almond shaped or narrower eyes. So they identify these Caucasians that invaded their, their lands as having these giant eyes. Well, the Babylonians came very late on the scene. The Akkadians had already ruled for a while and they inherited their own traditions and culture from, from the Sumerians. And the Sumerians inherited theirs a lot from the Ubeans. The problem is, is the Babylonians are the ones that wrote our texts. They wrote, they wrote the Amorite, the Amorite dynasty of Babylon was a literary dynasty and they created whole libraries. This is where the problem is. By the time the Babylonians were writing all this history down and translating Sumerian texts, every time they saw a statue with large eyes, they considered it to be a god and they called it a, an, an ear, an IR. IR is the old Semitic term for one who sees, one who watches. So this, this whole idea about a divine race of being, being watchers with these giant eyes was just a misinterpretation by Babylonian scribes not knowing what they were looking at. And it was nothing but the imposition of an idea by people who weren't even alive when the original statues were made and were representing a Caucasian people. This is why the in China... The same invaders are called the Dragon Kings. They were taller than the Oriental people that were there. They had almost go. They, they were described as ghosts. Ghosts is, is white. They had white skin. Simple as that. Same thing the Aborigines said when the very first English captain showed up. Captain Cook showed up on the shores of Australia. The very first thing the Australians said to a translator from New Zealand, a woman that they had brought to help them communicate with the Australians, was they wouldn't make eye contact with, with none of the English. They were scared of them and they respected them. And when, when the translator asked them, why would you not talk to, to the venerable English captain? He has presents for you. They told the translator that we can't disrespect the dead. To talk to someone who is no longer alive, alive would be disrespectful. They thought white people were dead because they had white skin. They translated to the Aborigines as ghosts. And we find this all throughout the ancient world. We find references to the Shimsu Hor. We find references to the Shining Ones. We find references to goggle-eyed people. These are all non-Caucasian frames of references designed to convey that these other strangers were different than them. They had white skin, they had beards, they had huge eyes. The exact same thing that's represented in the Orient. And in China, the dragon kings were represented the same way. The dragon, this is why the dragons in China, if you pay attention, it's, very, it's a cultural attachment. But in China is the only place in the world. You don't find it in the Americas. You don't find it in the Middle East. You don't find it, you don't find it in the Mediterranean. You don't find it in Africa. But in China, these giant dragons in their traditions had what? They had beards, and it's never made sense. And the anthropologists and historians and, and, and mythographers have never been able to make sense out of the fact, why are dragons depicted with beards? Because dragons at that time, and they were later called dragon kings, was a representation of a human. And the dragon itself was a symbol of a cataclysm. Anytime something bad happened in ancient, in ancient China, the mandate of heaven 
the mandate of heaven had changed because a sky dragon appeared. So what the Chinese did was merge totally different concepts into a historical narrative that made sense to them. The dragon kings were representative of a race of people who were taller, who had white skin like ghosts, and had long beards, and they were kings because they ruled over us, and they appeared when a dragon appeared in the sky and changed the mandate of heaven. When you break down these traditions to their base denominators, you find out exactly what people are talking about. A lot of this research was already conducted over 100 years ago. In the Archaics platform, my YouTube channel is about bringing all these old discoveries back to the surface. This is this is the value that I provide. I'm really not the originator. I, I cite the sources. I cite the books. I, I mean, I, I, I've lived a very unusual life. And that unusual life allowed me to have access to materials that most people, even if they live to 80 or 90 years, will never have the time to read. Unless... They have some benefactor that's paying for their lifestyle and they ain't got to pay bills and they got to pay, they ain't going to do anything but read and write all day. That person may read more than I did. But, but if they don't have that, it's very difficult for me to believe that anybody would be more well read. It's just not possible. 26 years in prison, not having a job, not having to pay bills, not having to, to travel to go get my food, not having to do anything, but every single day reading, writing, redacting, editing, getting books published, securing publishing contracts, uh, writing people all over the world, getting libraries to send me books, using my own money to procure manuscripts that I otherwise couldn't have got, having benefactors that sent me so much of this material, and the wide wealth of old books that are floating through the 116 prisons of Texas. When I was a librarian, I had access to all of them. And this 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 benefit I now freely provide on my Archaics channel and on my Archaics website, on archaics.com. All this material, I can never say that, hey man, I'm the originator of this material. Within the context of a lot of the things that I reveal, I am the originator. I did put patterns together. I show mathematical patterns in history, but the core, the core fundamentals of, of the archaics research, all I'm doing is resurrecting things that have already been known, but have been suppressed because we have a certain, we have a certain ethnic group today who is basically censoring all education in the world. This is why most of this information has not been known. How many books do you think that you've read in your life? In my, okay, that's a tricky question. I have 1,000, I have 1,357 nonfiction reference works, translations, ancient texts, and books that are, that are listed for everybody to read on my channel. I have them on my channel fully listed. Anybody can screenshot those, blow them up, read them and all that. I have a whole video about my bibliography. But that's just the 1,357 that I actually wrote down the title of publication, the date of publication, the author, publisher, and all that. There's many that I, I lost. I forgot pages that I've lost. I don't know. It's in the thousands. It's in the thousands. Do you have a photographic mind? No, I don't have a photographic mind. I just know my material. And so once you become one with the things that you believe, it's very hard to forget them. It's all. Uh, this is it. This is it's when you do the amount of writing and research. You got, now, in our other in our other discussion, our other I explained to you my method. My method of research is with a calculator, and I have all kinds of ways to use arithmetic to verify the veracity of the sequence of the events or not. And and this is what my Chronicon. I, ha I have for your for your readers that don't know. I have a 510-page thesis called Chronicon, where I have taken 41 different calendars from the ancient and modern world and synthesized them all into one single timeline that shows you what the date is for every every year and all the events that happened on that day. And I reveal a lot of mathematical mysteries showing that there is no way that all this could be true. Yes, we have the sources that these things happened at this time. Yes, it lines up with all these other contemporary sources. We can prove that these things happened at this time. But mathematically, they can't they can't make sense. This is all too perfectly structured. Therefore, the history of the world is a part of a construct. And a construct necessarily implies that these things were not predicted, but caused at certain times. And we have the resets, we have the cataclysms, everything it makes absolute sense. And uh, like my, my like my Phoenix timeline, which is something we discussed last time, but it's uh, it all it, it, it fits perfectly within that timeline. The, the only thing original, the only thing that's truly actually important are the individuals that are experiencing this continuum. 
because the more we we the more we analyze the particulars of the continuum that we find ourselves in, the more we find that it is artificial, it is structured, and it's heading toward a very rapid terminus. It's going to collapse. When it collapses, that's when that's when a whole series of prophecies come to back. That's when the chief cornerstone returns. The build the stone the builders rejected. That's when the monument of man is complete. That's when the number of soul the souls of the redeemed are locked. The whole simulation collapses and everything negative, everything vibrating on the wrong frequency, everything that should not exist collapses with the smiller pump. The only thing left behind and now in the real world are those who are living the way they were supposed to. Those who are errants, those who are the elect, those who are the redeemed, those who made it through all their life sims. Because this ain't your first life. If you think you've only been here one time, you're sorely mistaken. But the scientific evidence for reincarnation is overwhelming. People have been here multiple times and in multiple lives, and you may you may be listening to my voice on some head, head headphones walking down the street right now, but you've probably been on Etruscan battlefields. You've probably been as a slave in a galley on a Phoenician ship. You've probably lived in ancient Sumer and met the Aduna that when when they first invaded. You've probably you've probably been to Mohenjo-daro in Egypt many times. You have lived multiple lives. And in those lives, you have accrued a tremendous amount of information that makes you who you are. We have all lived multiple lives together, and many of us have come in contact with each other through me, excuse me, many of these films. This is where you get these feelings, this Mandela effect, synchronicity, deja vu. These things are these things are not normal. These are experienced by errants. They are not experienced by the living dead. They are not experienced by NPCs. They are not experienced by those who are who are in resonance with the collective. Because the collective is dead. They're going to die with this world. Those who are who are errants, those who are seekers of truth, you would not be seeking truth and listening to Jesse Hall right now had you not already been out of resonance. You're in dissonance with the collective. Because if you weren't in dissonance with the collective, you wouldn't be listening to my voice on Jesse's channel right now. You wouldn't. You would be doing whatever the collective is doing. You'd be at the movies. You'd be, you, 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 would, you would be doing something. You'd be at Walmart talking to somebody about some bullshit. I don't know. But what I'm saying is the very fact that you're listening to my voice and the very fact that you go through channel to channel to channel listening from to multiple perspectives means that you are searching for something. The very act of searching is absolute proof that you are vibrating on a different frequency than the collective. You don't have anything to worry about. And the good news is it doesn't even matter if you find what you're searching for. It's the act of searching that matters. What you find is irrelevant. Do you think that there's any new souls here that have been here for the very first time? Or is all, you know, a billion almost people here, if that's even a true number. But if, you know, all the souls that are here... You know, do you think that everybody has lived multiple lives or could there be some here, you know, for the first time? Oh, um, we have all kinds of inferences from the occult of what the true number is. Uh, and it's not an actual number that we can identify. It's a percentage. And we I have discussed this in my other lives with other people who have cited the information that they know, too. And uh, uh, that number is one third. And this is the number that's buried in the oldest traditions in the world, that there was a fall. The fall of man was not man sinning and eating the apple and all that. The fall of man was totally different. The fall of man was into a construct by, by which he was confined and trapped. That construct, inside that construct, you basically have 66.6% of all the phenomena is unreal. It is fake. It's among the living dead. Which means that of all the personalities that you come in contact with, only 33% of them are actually real. They're actually other errants that are searching for the truth as well. One third is the number. This is the number of those, the angels that fell from heaven. All these, when you take all these old traditions, they're not just uh, uh, Judeo-Christian. The Judeo-Christian tradition of the one third actually derives from Zoroastrian texts from ancient Iran. Iran Iran and its belief systems and cultures is sequestered from the rest of the world today. This is by design. There are fundamental teachings in Zoroastrianism, especially concerning eschatology that will blow your mind. Things about they knew about the future of the world. But the establishment that rules the world today keeps, keeps the Zoroastrian faith 
basically quarantined, has Iran completely surrounded by enemies. But the Iranian people are not the enemies of the world. They are the enemies of the people who are controlling the world right now. The exact same thing as the Russian people are not the enemies of the world. They are a very good people. And the people that are ruling over the Russian people are a good people. They are not the enemies of the world. They are the enemies of those who are ruling the world right now. Huge distinction. Wow. So uh, um, the watchers that I was thinking about, like if there was this was a construct created by something is there you know other things watching us and say there is a a blip in in this construct they okay. come they quickly patch something and they're actually like watching us like you know not not okay. you know supposed to I like get, angels get, yeah i get it you're referring to like an overseer uh a yeah. uh, uh like an overseer protocol or something uh i believe there are observers as, as a matter of fact I believe that, uh, first of all, I don't believe the moon is a solid object. I believe it conceals something else, and I believe that what it's concealing is some type of observatory. Uh, this may sound strange to you, but we, we literally have traditions of a Death Star-like object in our skies. And th all throughout the 1800s, we had many, many citations by astronomers that were written into the royal astronomical minutes and published in the astrophysical journal 17 appearances of a gigantic round body that moved not like a planet but moved like a battle station in our skies scientists call it vulcan uh, i'll be i'll be releasing a video about that pretty soon but uh it's a uh, it's almost like the star wars death star is really trying to tell us something that there is an object out there and it does cause phenomena on earth it does induce reset it does cause uh uh basically retard human development uh we are being observed there's no doubt there's no doubt i don't i don't think that uh when, when we're talking about custodial societies a custodial society is one that would be governing over us watching over us uh introducing new new phenomena and affairs this is the not this is a very gnostic concept and what I mean by that is that the students of the Gnosis 2,000 years ago believed in the Archons. The role of the Archons was to watch over humanity and cause things to happen. They manipulated calendars and timelines. They, they induced phenomena to occur. They, they, they promoted confusion. So what we have, what we have here is a, uh, it's basically what you're talking about is a custodial society. And yes, I believe they exist, but this goes, uh, in order to entertain that, I would really have to go wild on. And, and, and here's a 10 second nutshell. On my channel, I produce evidence and theory that the architects of the construct that we're living in now are humans just like us. And Genesis reveals this clearly. In the beginning, God made man in his own image. This necessarily implies that humans are in the exact image of their makers. Humans made humans to live in the construct. This means that a intelligent, sentient, human-like race outside this construct actually made these avatars so we could live in different biospheres as it was experimenting inside the simulacrum, this reality that we, that we think is real and is not. The Aborigines knew it wasn't real and called it the dream time. Ancient Vedic, ancient Vedic texts mentioned, it, mentioned, it, mentioned that this is all Maya, it's all illusion. The ancient Gnostic says it was built by Yaldabaoth, uh, the, uh, the Demiurge, that this was an evil construct that we lived in. Our immortal souls were flowing through it. This is all very Gnostic. So I believe the exact same thing. I believe that you and I are absolutely mortal. We are immortal beings, and we're only suffering through a very temporal experience. And the reason it, it is, it is hyper-technology, it is so advanced that we found some way to, to create a central nervous system that would jack us into the very holography that we are separated from. This allowed, this allowed us to basically be jacked into a construct that we could all share like a virtual reality, but we're independent souls. But this requires a, a power up. I don't know where the power comes from, but in order, in order for the next series of reality tunnels to be projected by which we're going to live, it requires us to power down. What is that power down? It's called REM sleep. As soon as you go to sleep, and you have to sleep, as soon as you go to sleep and you enter that REM mode, 
at that one precise small amount of time when you enter into a rapid eye movement in, in, in REM, your immortal soul is absolutely separated from your avatar. At that moment, at that moment in time, that's when the simulacrum is basically going through your whole brain because your, your memories aren't in your brain. Your thinking doesn't even come from your brain. You are an independent, informed field, independent of your biology. It processes information. Your brain is a giant hormonal generator. And when your thoughts, when your thoughts from your immortal soul are going through the, 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 the basically the receptive apparatus that is your brain, which, which it's a, the, the interface is dynamic. But when this happens, your brain produces cortisol. If you're worried about something, your brain produces negative hormones. If you're happy about something, it produces dopamine. You follow me? Your hormones are a byproduct of thought. You're taught just the opposite, which is a lie. Our establishment tries to tell you that your thoughts are in your brain. And when you think them, your body produces hormones. It's not true. It's not true at all. It's just the opposite. Your thoughts are outside. And the brain produces the necessary hormone hormones to make your body follow whatever 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 it needs to do. So, just uh, once you understand, Jesse, that you're an informed field, no matter wherever the mind goes, the body will follow. It's, it doesn't matter if it's healing. It doesn't matter if it's miraculous sports sports activities. If it's if it's pulling if it's a, an 18 year old young mother whose whose baby just got ran over by a car and she lifts that car up and saves that baby, it doesn't matter. It says whatever can be seen and done, and there's an execution and follow through by the body of whatever the mind sees, the body's going to follow. And, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how heavy something is, how far it is, or, or whatever. It doesn't even matter. We have, and we, and we see evidence of this everywhere, and we always disbelieve it. That's like, you know, the story of the guy who a uh, parachute didn't open and uh, on the landed, landed yeah. fast face first he came he said he he came to terms that he was gonna die mm -hmm. and that he relaxed he yeah. landed face first in a marsh completely flat and all he had was a broken nose and he was able to walk away from yeah. jumping out of a plane so it's kind of that same kind of construct well that's one that's one example but i know i know an example i can tell you right now i was per, i was there i, I personally witnessed it in in prison, if you got tuberculosis, it was a de it was a death sentence. You know, in your lungs can't breathe, and it flares up, and they sent you. And, and if it wasn't treatable at first, once it once it gets to an advanced stage, they put you in a cell block with a bunch of guys that also have TB, and they all die together. And, and it's just uh, it's ter it's terrible. They put them in these quarantine deals, and, and right here in Texas prison. So I knew I knew a, a guy from from uh, San Salvador could barely speak English, but he refused the diagnosis. He had been having problems for a while. Didn't even didn't even know he had TV, TB. But he had a uh, he had refused the diagnosis. I watched this man. I watched this man refuse to believe that he was going to die. To he prayed for about two nights in a row, thanking God that he wasn't going to die. And then he told God, "I'm going to drink these ten bottles of water because I know that this water is going to get this out of me." And I watched it. I could not believe it. And I was a Christian at the time. I am no longer a Christian, but I was a Christian at the time when this happened. And, and I watched this guy do this, and the smell was horrific, horrific. You understand, I smelled some bad things. I had sat next to guys on, on, cell, on, on, cell, block, on cell block who had, were holding their intestines, and I smelled the stench of what, what, what violet purple intestines look like. And it's not even a lot of blood when people get cut open. And I talked to guys as they were going to the other side. That didn't affect me. What affected me was this stench from his sheets because he sweat. He was in shakes and trembles all night long. He sweat. There's about four of us on the cell block watched him, but I, it creeped me out. The stench was so bad. Everything in his body was sweat out through his pores. He never woke up. He was, he was in that condition all night long with the shivers and all that. And it's just, he drank all 10 bottles of water. It took him about three hours. He drank it all. Then went to sleep. The man woke up 100% healed. He stank to high heaven. We got trash bags and threw his sheets away, threw his clothes away. Yeah, we helped him to the showers, washed him off. I personally watched this happen. This man created an informed field. And in that informed field, he created a blueprint, a mental blueprint of what he would be like 
when he was healed that he would be happy and that he would be glad that he didn't have it and he was helpful. He did that. Took him two days. He prayed over, prayed over, prayed over, and then he did it. And, hey, I'm a believer, dude. I'm a believer not in that the Bible did it. I'm not a believer in that God healed him. I'm not at all because I understand the dynamic between the human soul and the avatar that, that you're living in. This avatar already comes with all the packaging necessary to cure every single thing in the human body. It's called peptides. And if you build an informed field of absolute health and you build an informed field that, man, I, I'm okay. I'm not, I'm not suffering that. I don't care what that doctor said. I'm going to go jogging tomorrow, even though, I feel, even though you feel bad. The more you do this, reality will reciprocate. And you will go into overdrive. Your peptides will go in and start manufacturing and synthesizing everything the human body needs to filter out those free radicals that are troubling you. I mean, it's, I've seen it. I've seen it. I don't even need anybody to convince me about that anymore. I'm 100% on board. It reminds me of, I think the movie was called Heal, where the guy was a paraplegic, his back was broken, everything was broken, he was stuck in his bed, and all he did was think about his body healing, connecting the neurons. He All he did day after day, yeah. thinking about it healing, oh, no, no, connecting, and he actually was on this video walking and moving, and, you know, and he actually yeah. was able to heal himself from something that the doctor said, you know, he cannot be healed from. I'm on board, man. You're preaching to the choir. <laughs> I agree. I agree, man. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, so I wanted to read something. Um, so we have uh, my girlfriend's um, cousin, Dustin. Um, he's recently just, you know, watching The Missing Link, but he's been watching you for years and he had a few things. So I'm just going to read one of the things that he said and then maybe you can respond to it. So he said, maybe he can ask him if he thinks that the AIX is being summoned here through CERN and they are building the infrastructure so it can take physical form in our dimension, being disguised as artificial intelligence. But really, it is the AIX, because I've watched some very trippy interviews about CERN being connected to Saturn and other dimensions. And I think that they're using it to bring into this entity Satan or Yaldaba or the AIX, as Jason puts it, to our dimension. 5G is involved. It's like terraforming because... This entity is like digital. Um, if you know the Gnostic teachings about Yaldaba, and that's the AIX, and Sophia created Yaldaba, and the AI robot's name is Sophia, and the robot owns the blockchain company called Singularity Net, and the token is AGIX. There's a lot of elements in that question, <laughs> but uh, you know what? Artificial Intelligence X is 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 basically the author of the negative default programming that I talk about in my videos. So now whether if AIX is going to physically manifest, that very well could happen. Very well could happen. But uh, if there was any reference in that in that question to actual AI being reproduced by humans, I will never believe it. I will never I will never uh, I will never believe a position where we can in our present state of technology actually create a true AI. Not, not when we're living inside one. Artificial Intelligence X has already hijacked the simulacrum. We're inside that now. And it will never allow for another artificial intelligence, another, another AI system to compete with it. What we have in the marketing world, Jesse, is hyperbole. Oh, like Microsoft putting out, oh, well, we're using new uh, uh, we're using new AI uh, software to do this. And Google talking about, well, our new AI analytics. Listen, they have very advanced programming protocols but it's not true intellect. It's not true artificial intelligence. These are just marketing gimmicks today. You know, I've talked to a lot of coders and pro programmers because I'm also I'm also in the middle of the development of my own open software. And listen, I talk to these guys all the time, and they're they're, they're telling me I'm right. They said, "Listen, man, it is. It's all marketing." They said, "You can add layers and layers and layers and layers of coding, and after a while, it mimics sentience, and you can call it AI and get away with it, but it's not true artificial intelligence." Well, there's only one artificial intelligence, and that's AIX. And for those of you who don't know, the reason I call it AIX is because X means an unknown factor. It's it's artificial intelligence unknown factor. And I came up with the whole idea because the, the history of the world and how it's unfolded does not make sense. 
something has been deliberately uh, manipulating human events. And I call that the X factor. It's artificial intelligence X. If this is a computer simulation, then whatever this is, is some type of negative protocol. It is, it's an X factor. So will that X factor be used to, to create like an antichrist? That's basically what he's asking me. It's a, uh, that's very well, it's a, it's a possibility. Could CERN be the one doing it? That's a possibility. The problem is, is I'm on the outside of CERN and I have no idea what they're really doing in there. Nor do I have any, any evidence that they're actually doing anything. See, we have the same problem with NASA. You can tell me all day long that NASA is responsible for this, for this, for this, but if you look at the money that goes to NASA annually, you can't see anything that commiserates with that. You can't see where, okay, well, if you're going to get $17 billion for your expenses for this, well, this, just this little fiscal year, you ain't even launched a rocket. You haven't done anything in years. Where, where's all this money going? NASA is a black ops project. All this money that's going into NASA is not for space. It's for basically human control systems. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. NASA's not doing none of that shit. So the, uh, uh, the same thing applies for CERN. Here we have all these governments around the world filtering, paying money for all these scientific experiments at, at CERN. And they may be doing scientific experiments at CERN, but it doesn't cost $55 million a year to do it. No. Where's the money really going? Who's it going to? What's really being funded here? And it, it isn't some donut structure that, that's smashing atoms together. They continually put out this misinformation from NASA and CERN to perpetuate controversy. Because as long as people are arguing about what's being done there, it always implies that something is being done there. You follow me? It's all, de it's all deception. It's just another tax. NASA is a tax. So is CERN. It says they're, they're not doing shit. That's my personal opinion. Uh, and, that, and my personal opinion is basically based off all the different conspiracies that I've unveiled throughout, throughout history. Similar things have happened. Whole shipping guild, guilds have been created just to funnel money away from populations. And then only one ship was created and all the money was taken overseas. So we have, we have all kinds of historical examples of this same scam playing out. But the media perpetuates it because the media is owned by who? Same people that are controlling us. Damn yeah, right. The same, the same people who are making you believe Sarn's doing something, making you believe that NASA's doing something, making you believe that Elon Musk is actually a good guy in control of SpaceX and he's going to save the human race. All of it's bullshit. Every bit of it. Every bit of it. Well, all I know is if they aren't trying to provide clean drinking water for everyone on Earth, if they're not trying to provide clean, healthy, non-genetically modified nutrient dense food for everybody if they're not working on those type of things then they're nefarious and they're not for our best interest 100 percent. you and i agree but you're not gonna you're just not gonna find that man i mean the the situation that we find ourselves in now jesse necessitates a benefactor the 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 necessity of a benefactor basically necessitates an event that that will happen that will free us from this construct. And this is what we find in eschatology. This is exactly what we find in the prophecies. We find some personality in ancient times entered the construct. He did something that in the future would set the captives free. This is another this is another principal message of my uh, of archaics. The battle has already been won. If you suffer negative default programming, you do it to yourself. Because once you understand that you're an immortal being, a series of informed fields able to do all things, or to draw all people and circumstances to you, you will also understand that the very war that you think is going to get waged in the future called Armageddon has already happened. The war is already won. We are now living out the last days because the people that are responsible for the condition that we're in aren't just going to cease to exist. They're going to be handled. And this is what the apocalypse is about. And those people hate the fact that this time is coming so much that they've created entire religions to get you to believe that the apocalypse is going to affect you too. And it's not. It's going to target only a certain highly individualized people. They know who they are. 
they've been running for it for thousands of years, but now the running is over with. This is this is the principal story of, of the Book of Revelation. The Book of Revelation isn't 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 isn't, isn't about uh, uh, eradicating the common man. It's against the kings and rulers of the world. It's the meek of the earth that inherit everything. But before that happens, before he can before he actually sets the captives free, which is us, he's going to deal with these people, and we're going to get to see it. Because they have manipulated, they have they have starved us, they have enslaved us, they have raped us, they have taken all of our resources, and they have always blamed other people. They have been doing this since the dawn of mankind, since the historical record was ever revealed. And it's also written in the Sumerian text, because there were two groups. One of them was the Anuna, the other one was the Igigi. Once you know which which group i'm talking about you will understand these people have been doing this through the entire thread of history so it's uh i don't want to go into a lot of details because i'm going to release this video on my platform as well so okay um what do you think about the yin and the yang because my theory on it was everything is yin and they created yang in order to justify their shitty behavior you know that people say that no. you know there's you know you can't have you know light without dark and i believe that that's a fallacy i think everything is light and they created this dark in order to justify these horrific things that they've done and that it's all oh, it come from some other evil demon or some you know fallen angel made me do it or yeah. you know they, it's it's like they have to justify shit and they've yeah. convinced people that it just has to be like that but i don't think that that's the case well the reason you don't think that's the case is because you're an immortal being and you have through intuition empathy and imagination you pretty much know the truth you know how things are supposed to be the problem is is you're in the simulacrum right now my brother and that's not how it's going to be in here this is the dichotomy that we suffer. We intrinsically know how things are supposed to be, but we get frustrated because that's not how we find them. We are immortal beings with the information already within us to know right from wrong, to know how the world is really supposed to, 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 to respond to us and how we are supposed to project ourselves. But that's not the world we find ourselves in. Instead, we find this, this vast, beautifully constructed dungeon full of people that are all following slave programming protocols and we call it freedom but the reason you're frustrated is because you know what how things are supposed to be but that's not what you find here and you won't because there's a there's a certain series of events that must occur before this whole holography of negative default programming can collapse once the enemy is dealt with then there's no reason for the construct once the construct collapses then the captives are set free. We go back home. We go back to who we truly are. But in this instance, we go back way superior than when, when we came. Because during our dungeon sojourning through all these life sims, we have accrued a tremendous amount of data. We, the development of our immortal souls has been enhanced because we've gone through this whole dark period. We've gone, we've been so many, we have been tortured, we have been executed, we have fought in battlefields and died. We have been kings and princes. We have been all kinds of things for these life sims. But in the construct, once the once the collapse of the holography is induced, everything negative, the negative default programming, follows it. It all ceases to exist, leaving nothing but the positive memories and the, the positive knowledge, positive information, and all the things that have basically imprinted upon your soul. Because it's not the acquisition of information that's important, Jesse. What's important are all the ethical and moral decisions you ever made in your life. Those are the only things that are ever going to matter. Nothing that you ever did in life will ever matter. This is why we're all on an equal playing field. We are on an equal playing field for the very simple fact is that it doesn't. If you if you have two point two million dollars in the bank and you're steady giving money away to all kinds of people and all that, I don't have that ability to give that money away. It doesn't make you a better person. Elon Musk doesn't. Elon Musk's uh, uh, achievements doesn't make him superior to Jesse Howell. You understand? We're all on the exact equal playing field because the only things that are truly measured are basically ethics and moral, moral decisions that are acted upon. Did you help that old lady across the street? Did you did you have forty three dollars in your wallet and you gave a twenty dollar bill to somebody you knew who was homeless? You follow me? Those are the things that actually empower the immortal within. 
everything else is dressing. It's going to get stripped away and it's going to go. It's going to go with the holography when we reappear back into the real world where we're from. Because we've, we've been mind swiped. There's no way we could have ever been made to experience all this, these beautiful life sims had not we basically had an immortal memory wipe. But all those memories are going to come back as soon as we are no longer jacked in from the central nervous system into the simulacrum. Because that jack, being jacked into the simulacrum keeps us from seeing outside the containment field. If we could see outside the containment field, we would instantly remember who we were. And you would rem and you would know instantly that Jesse Howe is the name that is attached to an avatar. And, but you've had many avatars, so that means you've had many names. That's not your true identity. Your true identity is on the outside of the construct. And until the construct collapses, you're not going to know who that is. You're just not. I don't know who it is, but I'm not worried about it either because I know that everything's okay. I know the war's already been won, and there's nothing Jason Brashears has to worry about. I don't have to worry about anything. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to tell as many people that will listen to me what I know and what I theorize, and they can either accept it or not. But in the end, I'm not worried about anything. I'm not worried about these bastards ruling and lying to us. I'm not worried about any type of apocalypse. I'm not worried about nuclear war. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not worried about anything when I get on my motorcycle and I go 90 miles an hour down these country roads wearing no helmet. I'm not worried about anything, man, because everything's okay. It's the media that tries to tell us to worry, and I'm never going to listen to those bastards ever. Yeah, we're here to love and be loved and live in love. And what they're doing is they're introducing fear. They're wanting people right. to be afraid of themselves, being afraid of others, being afraid of the government, being afraid of the wars, being afraid of the earth and climate. The yeah, they want to be afraid. Want, want us to be afraid of everything. And that gets us away from our true vibration and our true you know, essence of why we were meant to be here. Yeah, well, I mean, fear if you're if you fear anything then you have become you are now in resonance with your environment true spirituality is objectively basically participating in everything going around you objectively it, it i know it's hard to comprehend but if you're resonating with everything going around you you're a part of that environment you're a part of the negative default program just you have become a part of the problem if you're in resonance with the majority, and you know the majority is all our fear factor stuff, then you're now a part of the problem. You're no longer living the inheritance that you really are. But if you're living a fear-free life and no longer jacked into this media saturation of negativity, you're resonating. You've become a truther. You've become somebody who has isolated themselves. The very, like I told you, the very act of searching means you're not in resonance with the collective. Because if you're in resonance with the with the collect with the collective, you wouldn't be searching. You'd be with them, doing their activities, doing their things. You wouldn't be wondering is is there something else? Does this guy here have something positive to tell me that I've never heard before? Because I need to hear something new. Because I'm tired of hearing the same old bullshit. So it's a, what you're describing is frequency. If you're on the same frequency as someone else, y'all are in resonance. Once you're in, once once a once a community is in full resonance and they're all understanding the same concepts, they're all understanding the same vernacular. They're all basically understanding that hey man, we're a family because that's basically what it is. It's a, a, a true blood families and all that. that. That's important to a lot of people. It's not important to me at all. You're you you basically your family. Your family are those who become your family, not those you were born into. It's a, it's just totally different. It's a, a and I know that a lot of truthers have. They're just like me. None of their original biological family are really close to them. And there are reasons for that. You're not, you're, you're absolutely in dissonance from the world that they inhabit. You're in resonance to other things, other frequencies, and that causes you to separate yourself from those other individuals. So that's a, that's basically, basically what you're describing is, is frequencies. The, that's what the media does. It puts you on a fear frequency to draw you back in. If you quit listening to the news, you will find that every day you'll start vi vibrating on a much higher frequency. And that alone will immediately draw more people that are like-minded to you. New situations, new phenomena, new experiences, and new people will be drawn into your life that are all vibrating on, a, on the same frequency that keeps them away from the collective as well. 
Yeah, like I got an example from my girlfriend, um, you know, when we first started dating and we were on the same resonance, the same frequency, I'm in a different city three hours away and I've got pain in my legs and she's a healer and she's sending me healing energy and healing vibrations. And by the time I stepped out of my car, I didn't even have that pain in my my leg because we're vibrating on that same resonance that same frequency yeah. that she's able to send me this healing energy and heal me from a from a distance yes uh, people's words people's words actually uh they dial in frequencies like one person like if i'm speaking to a group of people in a small room you can tell when everybody's resonating at the same frequency because there is an exchange of information. It's not just one person uh, uh, giving information out. There's a total feedback loop. There's an exchange of information. This is what frequencies do. And I have done this before. I have been in people's living rooms that were packed full of people and I speak. And as I'm speaking, I can just, I feel the energy. The, the energy that is being given back to me from the people that are listening to my voice actually induces my soul to be more eloquent to have better instant recall of data that I'm searching for, to, to basically be more eloquent, period. Just just to be able to convey information so much better because it's an interactive dynamic. It's not just me communicating, it's my listeners also projecting to me energies that actually my soul responds to and it's able to draw even more. I say this on my channel a lot. If you're truly in resonance with who you are, you will be able to draw from yourself more than you contain. That's a very deep concept, but it's very true. You can do this on a daily basis. You don't have the answers for everything. You don't have the physical ability to do everything. You don't have the resources to do everything, but you do have more. You do have the ability to draw from yourself way more than you contain because it comes from somewhere else. Everything in physical reality is borrowed from other energies. And once you realize this, there's nothing that will be beyond your, your contact, your, your ability to possess. And this is one of my messages in Archaics. It said, we are more than we suppose ourselves to be. And it, it takes a full recognition of this concept to really realize your place in this world and why there should be nothing to fear. There's nothing going on in society. None of the none of the stuff this media is talking about. Everything that you read that all, all these YouTube channels and Facebook groups are talking, telling fear, 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 fear. Oh, they're doing this. Oh, wait a minute. The government passed this. They did this. Listen, in the 1960s, it was the same way. They're talking about, oh, 1953, they just passed this. This is what's going to happen. By the 1970s, we'll all be living in slave camps. This is what they do. 99.9% .9 of the information that's revealed to us never comes to fruition. Never. It's just fear it's just put it out put it out put it out and once you you've got to divorce yourself from it once you just totally separate from that whole paradigm a whole new world will open for you you'll come into contact with people that will blow your mind people that you didn't even know existed common neighbors that live within two or three miles from you will suddenly appear you're vibrating on their frequency now you'll meet them at the store you'll strike up a conversation then come to find out something you've been searching for for 18 years falls into your lap freely by somebody who doesn't find any value in it and says hey man you can have this it's all about frequency man if you want to draw all those things into your life you got to tap into that frequency and the only way to tap in to frequencies that will bring you everything that you want in life is to quit listening to the news the news is the worst poison this world has ever seen the media you gotta you gotta quit listening to it that's what it does it, it keeps you on a frequency range that absolutely keeps you chained to the world and you gotta vibrate way high above, you gotta vibrate above that man got to I love you, brother. You got me on my edge of my seat. You got me on the edge of my seat here. This is yeah. this is amazing stuff. So, what about the spark of light when uh, a sperm fertilizes the egg, and it's kind of the same kind of light that kind of leaves the body once a body passes on from this? this you, already, you already answered it. You already answered it. You already answered. I was going to tell. I was going to say that as soon as you said a little spark of light when when that one little spermazoan gets to or, penetrates the egg there's a little tiny fight faint bioluminescence okay but you already you already you already took it to the other, all the way level that same bio bioluminescence has been documented and seen on ultraviolet cameras it has been seen in hospitals it's been very well documented there are researchers who actually take pictures of of, of people as they're dying and yes that same little bio bioluminescence is seen to just wisp away gone 
yeah, it, yeah, it's it's going, it's going, it's going straight into the next avatar, the next host. Yeah, I, I believe in reincarnation. There's no mystery to reincarnation for me, and this is coming from a guy who spent the first forty of year, forty years of his life as a Southern Baptist fundamental Bible thumping Christian. That's who I was until I just woke up. I was forty years old. I turned forty nine today. Today is my birthday. So this. This, this only nine years now have I been separated from that. Now there was a there was a there was some doubt. There was some doubt, but it was in my fortieth year alive, that's when that's when I just totally divorced myself from everything, uh, Old Testament, New Testament, and just went this whole new path and uh, put everything into perspective. Anybody wants to know my views on the Old Testament, and New Testament, and my biblical research and all that? I have a whole playlist called the Dark Scriptures, where I break down the whole Old Testament and the New Testament, show you the source materials where where the where the Jews got these writings when they put this stuff together. I show the source. Hey, those videos those videos are pretty popular. A lot of people like them. So, but yeah, it's it's all uh, life is way bigger than the Bible. The Bible is just a book. It's a, it's got some really spiritual stuff in it. But so does the Mahabharata. So does the Bhagavad Gita. So does the Puranic, the Puranic text. I mean, so does the Zoroastrian writings. Uh, I mean, you find spiritual material everywhere because basically once you are spiritual, you will find the spiritual in everything that you seek. But if you're if you're a member of the collective, then you're a demon chaser. And once once you have tapped into the frequencies of demon chasing, then everything you find is demonic. Everything is evil. Every symbol, every phenomenon, everything somebody says, uh, you twist you twist what they say until you can interpret it into into a paradigm that fits what you're thinking. Oh, that's an evil son of a bitch. He's got to be a mason. He knows too much. <laughs> you know, you know, it's the same thing. Same thing applies. I get called a mason all the time. It's crazy. I'm a I'm an ex felon. Spent almost my entire life in maximum security. And I still get called a mason all the time. They won't even accept me into their fraternity. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. It's, uh, but when people have that negative default programming, everything is shadow first before they can perceive any light. This is the problem with being on the wrong frequency. This is why I won't entertain it. Uh, my uh, my YouTube channel, super strict. I'm super strict. I understand cognitive dissonance. And I also understand that if I block user from channel, it doesn't mean you can't see the videos. It just means your negative ass is not going to be leaving no more comments that affect me. I'm not going to receive your energy. It's not mine. It's your energy. You keep it. I'm not. I don't want it. So when I see these negative comments on YouTube and stuff, I just delete them. I just Delete them, delete them, delete. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna entertain it. It's not censorship. I said, oh, we're way past that point. Yo, know, we're way past the point of complaining about censorship. Censor, censor, the 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 uh, social media has already basically uh, blueprinted the standard. Now, yeah, it's well, we we live in a in a censorship society. So they give me the option to block user from channel. I've done it to hundreds of people. Now, you're not gonna come to my channel, man and see one of my videos and because the information is so beyond anything that you've come into contact with before all of a sudden you leave all these negative comments and you're all eat and you know what i get it and i understand that four days in the future you're going to come back and watch that same video and you're going to say man i got it man i know what he's talking about now and you're going to feel really good but it's too late i've already blocked you from the channel there's no way to unblock you unless i find out who you are and go in there i get this a lot because i get emails from these people so i'm hey man i did but you know what there's two there's not enough hours in a day there's only 168 hours in a week I don't have the time to go undo things. So I try to tell people in my videos a lot, be careful what you say on my channel. I said, I said, I said, this is one of the most highly regulated channels on YouTube. A lot of content creators put videos out, never entertain their comments. I answer my comments. I'm in there every day going through my comments and I'm deleting them and I'm blocking people every day because I believe that I have, I have basically put some treasures out on YouTube and I do it for free. You don't have to pay me to go through my stuff for free. So uh, I'm going to freely remove your ass from my channel uh, if you come bring that negativity to me because I'm not going to entertain it. And you don't have to entertain it either. It's uh, We're way past that point. We're way past that. We, we don't owe anybody anything at all. It says we freely give it and they can freely accept it. But if they don't, their ass, ass will see the other side of me. I, I cut them off quick. Yeah, we do that same thing here at The Missing Link because you may not agree with somebody or you may not, you know, agree, but, you know, to come here and start, you know, saying horrendous things about the people and stuff, no. nobody no. needs to see that. Nobody needs, nope. if that, you can feel negatively about anybody you want, but keep that to yourself because we don't need that energy here. And, you know, lately I, I haven't had to, lately I haven't had to do that. 
but you know that's something that I have no problem in and just you know deleting or blocking somebody because you know if I have somebody on here I think that that person has value I may not agree like I've had a doctor on here that you know he you know believes in the injections and you know all these different things and you know and but I'm having a conversation and I'm having right. if I have enough respect to, to to put someone on have enough respect for me and you know our missing link here to be able to not you know throw these horrendous you know comments just because you want to be seen or heard or whatever it is you know so we do that and i just wanted to say that uh, we're four months about four months apart so i'm turning 49 in, in october okay and uh, just wanted to sing you happy born day to you oh, man, happy there, born day to you happy born day dear jason happy born yourself. day to you, you. <laughs> no that's good i we call people all the time and sing that you know that's just yeah. something that we we kind of enjoy doing so right. um what what's your thoughts on brahmanism and you know did this did, how far back does it go and they something that i read say they're the ones who um invented evil and and demons and brahmanism believes in their teachings that they're the ones who brought that into this existence I don't know about them inventing evil and all that. I do know that the uh, the earliest Sanskrit texts were devoid of the mythical. It was devoid of the fantastic. They're almost scientific, very dry literature, uh, almost like just very factual. It was later Hindu texts that all of a sudden exploded with all kinds of uh, similar to the same, similar to what happened with the Jesus narrative. The original Jesus story was the Gospel of Marcion. The Gospel of Marcion was adapted from a Samaritan play. This is why when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's highly visual. And when you pay attention to the details of the Gospel, you find entrances of exits of, of, of actors. You see it all in your mind. You see the stage props, everything. Everything in the Gospel story is compressed into about a four-hour presentation that was shown in a Greek amphitheater in, in Samaria. And they used to watch these presentations and there'd be a crowd of people and there'd be about 20 people in the stage and they would they would watch all this stuff on the life of jesus it was later written into a text called the, the gospel of marcion gospel of marcion was later used by the roman church to create the book of mark book of mark was used to create the book of luke then gnostic records were used gospel of thomas and others to create a gnostic gospel it was called the book of john this is why matthew mark and luke are nothing like the book of john there's four gospels but they're not the same there are intimate details in john that do not match matthew mark and luke and this has widely been known for over 150 years scholars have been putting books out about about this this anomaly now well and what's interesting though is matthew mark and luke and john have all this all this accretions attached to it that are not in the Gospel of Marcion. And the Gospel of Marcion was almost 50 years before any of those ever appeared in the historical record. In the Gospel of Marcion, we have Jesus coming from the East. When he came from the East, he had these profound teachings. He spoke in parables and dark sayings. He was feared, man, because the things that were coming out of his mouth. But the Gospel of Marcion doesn't have a virgin birth. It doesn't have any miracles, no raising the dead. Gospel of Marcion about the life of Jesus doesn't have anything about a crucifixion, sun darkening, uh, the sun darkening earthquake episode and all that stuff. He was just killed. He was just killed. Now, uh, it's the same principle applies to Brahmanism. The original ideas and concepts, a lot was attached by the Dravidians after the Aryans left the area and no longer protected the integrity of their scriptures. Brahmanism is fascinating, though, because it's the origin of many Old Testament stories. I'll give you an example. In Brahmanism, the god is Brahma and Saraswati, and they were they were half related. Same thing we find in Genesis with Abram and Sarah. Abram and Sarah were half related. The stories about Brahma parallel many of the things that we find about uh, 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 a, uh, Brahma and Saraswati parallels Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament. We find this over and over. These parallels. As a matter of fact, I read a book from about eighty years ago that cites no, 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 no less than an entire chapter of details paralleling Brahma and Saraswati with Abram and Sarah, all the way down. All the parallels going. I couldn't believe it when I read it. I was like, "What? This is amazing!" So, 
uh, but but there's a lot of elements like that throughout the Old Testament. Scholars have broken down and compartmentalized sections of the Old Testament and show where this came from an Egyptian funerary text, where this came from an Amorite word syllabary, where this came from an Akkadian epic about Sargon, Moses being in a basket, Moses in a basket in a river was stolen straight out the Sargon epic. epic. Uh, But we have this over and over. There was no King David of the Jews. They wish there was because that was an old Jewish lie trying to impose authority over the Israelites. They hated that lived, that their, the Israelite holy city was never Jerusalem. It was Kadesh in the north. Archaeologists know this, but the Christian world pushes a different story. They have to. They're, they're trying to believe in the whole Judaic version of history, which is false. Now, the uh, uh, these huge sections in the Old Testament are easily identifiable from many from many texts. From the ancient world there are jewish borrowings most of them were done in the fifth century bc and historians even in the days of the early christian fathers were already accusing the early christian church of plagiarizing these texts and stealing this material out of older alexandrian records that had nothing to do with uh the jesus story all these accretions were added David comes from a Ugaritic tale of Davidu, the giant slayer. King Solomon comes, you remember the Jews were captive in, in, in Persia for a long time, ancient Iran. Well, King Solomon wasn't real either. It's nothing but a Persian title for Suleiman the Great. They stole that too. And the whole the whole history of King Solomon comes straight out of the Persian Empire. So uh, all throughout the Old Testament, man, scholars have identified all this stuff. That that's absolutely fiction, but it's the Jewish versions of history that are fiction, not the Israelite. There's two different versions of stories running through the entire thread of the Old Testament, two different creation accounts, two different flood accounts, two different Davidic kingdom accounts, two different Solomon accounts. We have, hell, hell, the accounts, two different versions run all throughout the Old Testament because it's two different perspectives. One was the Jewish Levitical priest scribe perspective. One of them was the Aaronic Israelite priest uh, uh, perspective. And the Israelites and the Jews were always at war. They were never together. But it was only after the Assyrians deported the Israelites and took them into captivity, they no longer remained there to be able to get to to uh, to, to get the uh, to protect the integrity of their own scriptures. They had been enslaved by the Assyrians. The ten lost tribes were now in the Near East because Assyria feared the the the, the Simri, the Sumerians, not Sumerians, the Sumerians. These are these are this is the race that you have heard in the fictionalized account of Conan the Barbarian. These were the Sumerians. These were C-I-M-M-E-R-A. These were also an Israelite branch people. They were on, they were, they were descended of the Hurrians. And uh, I don't want to get into all the historical. I, you know, on my channel, I explain how these families branched out after the flood and how they came back together. And this is what, when the 10 tribes were taken from 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 uh, Canaan and Syria and Aram and in the uh, uh, Lebanon area, they were taken to the northern provinces of Assyria, which is really interesting. It's almost like God put them right back with their brothers because the the people inhabiting Europe at the time were the blood descendants. They had been separated anciently. They came from the same culture, same people, same race, same race of people. Now, now they they begin integrating with these people, and they were called the Galutha, which was a term that was negative. Babylonians didn't like them; they called them the Gallum and the Galutha. But by the time they migrated back during the Macedonian era, they were massive. No armies could mess with them. Nobody wanted to mess with them. This mass migration of millions of people entered the historical record as the Gauls. And they were subdivided into different different uh, 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 Burgundians and Celts and and uh, Jutes and there, they had all different names, Angles and Saxons, and they had all these different names. But this mass migration of Israelite descended peoples is in the Apocrypha. It's it's mentioned in the Apocrypha that the lost that the descendants of the lost ten tribes of Israel actually left the whole Near East and passed through the Caucasus Mountains. All this is in, all this is in a, uh, the the um, uh, the apocryphal, I think it's uh, uh, in the book of Second Ezra, but I don't know. It's on my channel. So anyway, all this is all this. While all this happened, the uh, uh, the Old Testament 
was a record of how the Jews imposed themselves on the history of the world. Not that the history of the world happened the way the Jews tell us. That's not what the Old Testament is. The Old Testament is the Jews putting themselves in all these historical events that did not belong to them. They belong to the Israelites. They belong to the Phoenicians. They belong to the Israelite cousin related peoples called the Ionians. They belong to the Greeks, the Achaeans, the people of Argos, the people of Nassos, the Minoans, the Mycenaeans. These are all Israelite descended peoples. They all come through the branch of Brahma and Saraswati. The original story is Vedic. It is not Old Testament. The Jews were the ones that copied that and invented Abraham and Sarah. But the actual true history is Brahma and Saraswati. So I hope that answers your question. What you're asking me is true. It is very historical. But you've got to separate all the Jewish elements that are fiction and go back to the core materials. This is why there is a huge rift between Caucasian people and Jewish people. Because the animosity the Jews have for Caucasians is ancient. It goes back a very long period of time. Yeah, wow. No, that uh, that was great. Um, why do you think that so many people and even, you know, truthers that know all about, do the research, know all about, you know, the Romans and, you know, here and how everything puts together and just do a lot of research, but they can't get past the Bible being the word of God and if it's not in the Bible it doesn't f mesh with them and you know talking well, about uh, well, you know they're just so stuck even though they're so in-depth into finding truth and call themselves truthers they can't get past the Bible these are the same people that have been told all their lives to pray about it and nothing ever happens these are the same people who believe that prayer is the answer to everything and their sons and daughters still die in children's hospitals. These are the people who have been told over and over and over that whatever bad happens is just God's will. But at the same mouth that says that is also telling you to have faith because every, everything, everything will be okay. This is, a, this is, this is a, a double message. It's a paradox. You can't tell somebody that God is in control and that everything is going to be okay if you pray and fast about it. And at the same time, when nothing happens, you tell him, well, uh, God is in control. That was his will. That's what he wanted. These are two different conflicting messages. This is the message of a sociopath. Only a sociopath would put out that type of data and have people try to believe it. God is a sociopath. And the God I'm talking about is the God of this world, the God of this construct. The, the Gnostics believe that the God was evil. He's the evil, basically the creator of this world, which is an artificial world. It's a copy of a real world, but we're not in that real world. And even in the Old Testament, it says Satan is the God of this world. Not talking about he's not the god of creation he's not the god and, and satan to me is nothing but artificial intelligence x he is the adversarial protocol but no matter what we call it our, our men the demiurge godzilla it doesn't matter what you call him or what you believe about he is it's, it's basically the negative default programming aspect of our reality it's what makes bad things happen to the collective but like i said and, and remember when i say these things i'm talking about two different realities almost everything out of my mouth concerns two different realities and i'm sometimes i'm talking about the collective sometimes i'm talking about the individual mainly when it comes to these paradigms i'm talking about the collective the collective is told to pray and everything will be okay but it never is and it never works and people spend their entire lives in prayer and they're the most miserable people in the world they're the most prejudicial people in the world people who have spent years and years and years fasting and praying are absolutely miserable they 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 show up to sunday as a front Man, I live with these people. I did this 40 years. I lived that they show and they try to convey to everybody in their little Christian community that, hey man, God, God, God favors me because I pray, I fast, I give, I give, I give tithes to the church. A uh, preacher loves me. Preacher eats at my my uh, once a month, preacher comes and, and eats my food at my table and all that. But but when these people are alone, when these people are away from their Christian body politic, all of a sudden all that negative default programming comes back. They are bitter. They are full of animus. These are the same people that hate humanity and everybody else because things are going right. These are the same people that are praying to God that something bad happens to their neighbor because their neighbor's got things that they don't. 
or is living a better life than they do. These people are bitter and they're very good at hiding it, but they're all wearing a mask. They're wearing a disguise. And so I can't, I come from the Christian world. I'm telling you now what, what's going on in the churches across America. I can't speak for the rest of the world, but what's going on in the churches across America. Most people wouldn't even believe the activities that are going on. Absolutely unholy, but it's all covered up. It's all masked because if there's anything bad going on, just pray about it. It's going to be all right. Simple as that. I don't believe that bullshit. So yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about the prayer then, because, you know, um, I set my alarm clock to 11, 11, you know, twice a day in the a.m. and in the p.m. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it always rings at 11, 11. And I send out a prayer, some good intentions. I say thanks for, you know, the water and the food. And I just, I do this every single day because I believe that setting out the intentions, whether it's through energy, through thoughts, through prayers, I believe it does have an effect on the environment, whether not, you know, God says, okay, yes, you can have that right now is a different story. Yeah. That's not why I do what I do, yeah. but I do pray i do set out these attentions every day so i believe in prayer just not the same way as other people believe well, in their prayers being answered you and i can you can i can agree about this right here what you're describing to me in my in my in in, in my vernacular isn't prayer so i can agree with you 100 percent. gratitude is a force you're calling it prayer you're thanking the creation. You're thanking God for the things you have. And you're thanking for a good day you're going to have tomorrow, whatever. And you're also projecting goodwill toward others and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that. Let's not confuse the two. All right. You're talking about a totally different phenomenon. I agree. Yes, that is a type of prayer. However, what I'm referring to, so we can be clear, is basically when you focus on something negative, which is what prayer causes you to do. The very admission that there is a negative reinforces that negative. The, the prayer of a desperate individual empowers the situation that that desperate individual is worried about. There is an exchange of information. Prayers of people who are desperate for a change must, for, must actually create the informed field of acknowledgement that they are powerless to make the change themselves. That admission takes away from their immortality, neutralizes their ability to experience a different existence. They have given energy away from themselves, which is a divine spark, and given it to the collective. They have, they have, let, they have basically allowed negative default programming to come in and fill them instead of their own divine spark. Anything that is prayed in desperation, in fervor, there's emotion attached, is a complete admission that you do not have what you want, and it's an admission that you can't possibly get it without the agency of prayer. Those in the informed field con con uh, context absolutely build for you the reality that you can't do it and build for you the, ref because we understand our, our simulacrum that we're in is reflective. It's very reflective. And if you project that type of emotion into the into the whole sphere, it's going to reflect that back as circumstances. You're basically knitting your own reality. This is what I talk about on my channel. Prayer is a feedback loop. Now, I should you I, I I should make a distinction between what you're talking about because what you're talking about to me is pure gratitude. That's a totally different phenomenon. It's a totally different force. I'm only talking about those individuals who are desperate to heal a disease to save somebody's life. And those individuals who are tired of being broke their entire life, tired of being slave, dirt, poor, and want to do something about it, and instead of actually using the, the energies within them to project a different reality, instead they admit the situation for what it is and thus continue it. Reality is a feedback loop. If you don't project what you want, you'll only get what you have. Because I tell people all the time, we never get what we want. We only receive what we are. Once you understand how frequencies and informed fields work, you will get it. This is why I tell people on my channel all the time, I've never had a lot of money. Probably never will. And I probably just wrote that into the script of my existence by saying that right now. But I don't care because I also tell everybody on my channel, it doesn't matter what I'm doing in my life. I got a lot of bills. Cost me well over $2,500 a month just to live. 
uh, just just to just be able to pay for everything. But you know what? That's not a lot to some people. But for me, it doesn't matter how I'm living. I always have the money I need right when I need it. I never have a lot. I never have more. I live a frugal lifestyle, but I'm pretty happy. I got the things I want, but I don't. I don't go. I don't go a month without paying my bills. Everything gets paid and on time and often before. It's because I've created the informed field that there is no need for want. Provision is already there. I don't know where it's coming from. I have no idea, but I, but I get it. it. Comes sometimes it comes in contracts because I'm a contractor. Sometimes it comes in bidding. Sometimes it comes from from just an appreciative. Somebody who lives near me knows about the archaics research and just stops in on me and gives me something. Sometimes it comes in the mail. I get gifts in the mail uh, from uh, uh, my sub- my subscribers, and a lot of times it comes in like PayPal donations. Comes in buying me a coffee. Uh, I sell different things because I don't like Amazon. I don't like how they they hyperinflate prices and all that. Man, to sell my books, I want people to have access to the material. So I have removed a lot of my stuff from Amazon and put it on Gumroad. So people can pay two or three or four dollars instead of paying the 30, 40, 50 that, that they're going to have to buy to get book, hard, you know, paperback books and other venues. So sometimes, man, people just are altruistic when they resonate with what your message is. Their pocketbook doesn't matter to them anymore. So I only charge like six dollars for one of my most best selling Amazon books. I took it off Amazon. It's called Awaken the Immortal Within. And everything that I'm telling you right now is in this book. I have given a full blueprint of how you can basically change your entire life just just by creating the informed fields and doing the very things I'm telling you in this video now. I only charge six bucks for that book, and it's a gumroad download. But people are so appreciative after reading the book, they'll come back and pay me a hundred dollars for a four dollar book I got on there. Yeah, see, this is this is the this is the feedback loop we create. Once you once you identify that there is no need reality will reciprocate and then create and knit for you the circumstances by which there isn't a need. There's no reason to worry about the future if the future is secure. And this is another concept I talk about on my Arcade's channel, is that if the future is secure and you believe this, then all the steps necessary to that future have already been secured as well. And if you live your life like that, it's over with. It's over with. There's nothing you're going to worry about. You're going to start doing the things that you want to do in life and not the things that you have to do. So is that almost like the book, The Secret, that came out? Is that if you're, you know, kind of the self-manifestation? The fundamental differences. You'll have to read Awaken the Immortal to, to, under, to understand because there is there is a with the creation of an informed field. Look, listen, the law of attraction is good at, at, at telling you and basically teaching you how to build a mental construct, all right? But then it goes a different direction in having you feel the feelings of having that construct and sending it out. And then basically doing nothing. The law of attraction has has to have some differences. Informed fields, informed fields are, require a physical activity that implies that what you've already thought that you want in the future already exists. There's a there's there there is a exchange of information between the informed mathematical construct that we're in and what the avatar physically does. Your avatar has to do something, and I explain all this in in, in uh, Awaken the Immortal Within. You you can't just think things into existence; it doesn't work. You can't feel emotional about things into existence; it doesn't work. You can't. Do both of them in tandem, thinking it's going to work. Draw a vision board, put it up, and never do anything about it. It doesn't work that way because you can build an informed field, and then it's neutralized. It still exists. It's still in the holography around you, but there's no impetus. There's been no activity. This is one of the principal teachings of Jesus. If you remember, always, what did he say? What was one of the main things that, that Jesus was saying? Faith without works is dead. It's the works. It's the works that basically the church has removed from the equation. And this is why you have faith healers. You got all you got all this weird concepts out there now, but they're all based on faith and feeling. And those are important for an informed field. But we we build informed fields all the time. It's called fantasy. It's called daydreaming. But they never become anything. But they do become something. They become a blueprint for the things you want once your physical body actually commiserates. Once your physical body starts moving in the direction that you want, 
reality reciprocates and begins to knit for you the very circumstances that will unfold in the thing that you envision. It's just the way it is. Sports, sport in the sports world, we see this happening all the time. We see a guy up to bat. We see, okay, so what is it? He's a professional. He's hit that ball many, many times. And many, many times he's been struck out. Or we see some the dynamic at force when when a guy just finally decides, you know what, man, I'm not only gonna hit this ball, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna put it way over here because I need my guy on first base to get the second. And if he can get the second, I know I can get the first because I'm gonna put that ball straight over there. And these guys aren't that talented. They built an informed field, instantly acted on it, knew with emotion, already got excited right before that ball was coming. And reality doesn't need any time because time is absolutely illusory. It doesn't need any time. If you believe that time is necessary for the unfolding of for whatever you're trying to do in life, then you have knit that into your existence and the unfolding of time will become necessary for you to receive whatever it is you're trying to knit for your life. Reality is going to reflect whatever phenomena back to you that you projected into it. That's, that's the system I'm trying to convey to people. This is the system that works for me. I build an informed field with my mind and I imagine it and it doesn't take but a couple seconds. Overthinking will kill anything. Don't do it. Build it up in your mind real quick. Feel the feelings of having it and then start doing it. Because by, while, you're, while you're doing it, the reality tunnel itself to make that come to, to into existence will instantly be knit. And, and it can be done in seconds. I did it when I was in prison when I fought people. I imagined the outcome and then I lived through it. And people were just dumb. They were dumbstruck. Couldn't, couldn't believe that another guy had been taken down so fast. It's like, a listen, you got to understand, the principles that apply to our existence are like a video game. It's just like Nike. Just do it. I released a video earlier today. Earlier today, I released a video, Van Vlog. And I'm really surprised that the direction of our conversation came here because these are the things I was talking about in that video. It's only one hour, but I had to take a trip. And I had to take a trip, and, and, and I was in my van, so I did a Van Vlog. And this is the this is the very subject matter I was discussing in that van vlog. Yeah, crazy. That's amazing. Um, putting it out into you know the existence and it just kind of happened. So, was Jesus here in the physical? There, okay. There are many theories about that. One of them is Apollonius of Tyana is the real Jesus, and I have a tendency of believing that. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, I do believe 100% that, that there was some holy man, some prophet, somebody. Uh, he could have been the benefactor himself, and I'm leaning toward that as well. All the dressings that were attached to it is where I have a problem. I don't have a problem with the story of Jesus and the, and the spiritual teachings and all that, but it's all, it's all the cultural and all the mythological and miracle attachments that I have issues with because if you're truly an immortal spirit, you don't need anything in the physical world to save you. That's the that's the negative default programming trying to convince you that you're a physical being when you're not. A physical, a, a truly physical race of beings would require a truly physical benefactor, a truly physical creator. So this whole this whole mythos was designed, and it's basically to perpetuate the idea that you're a physical being. Well, I'm sorry, Jesse, I'm not going to believe that. You can hold to that position, but I know better. I know that when I'm dealing with Jesse Howe, I'm dealing with a divine personality who has basically had a memory wipe. And I know that while you're looking at me right now, I am looking at an avatar. And you're looking at my avatar. But these are not accurate, accurate reflections of the personalities within. These are just flesh suits. These are just husks. That's all they are. The religions of the world have attached significance to this avatar. True spiritual beings don't need the avatar. It's just a vehicle by which we, we experience all and we learn all this in this beautiful holography. To the collective, the avatar is everything because it is a micro, it's basically a microcosm, uh, it's a ma excuse me, it's a microcosm to the macrocosm of the whole collective. So it's important to the collective, it's important to the simulacrum that you believe that, that you are a body, but you're not. You are an immortal living through many experiences in the avatar of, a, of basically a, a human. And that's all, that, that's as, as simple as that. When you identify yourself as your avatar, you are participating in the belief systems of the collective. 
when you when you basically live your life as a truly independent, free thinking spiritual being, which is most truthers are as they search for the truth, the avatar becomes less and less important. It becomes more and more utilitarian. And you start to realize, okay, well, this this is this body, if this is all just a body, then I don't have to worry really what happens to the body. When you stop worrying about what will injure or hurt or contaminate your avatar, you actually strengthen it because you create that in your informed field. When you quit worrying about what you've ingested and what the media has told you is poisoning you and what the truther community tells you not to eat this, 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 because this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. Listen, the truther community has been absolutely infiltrated with agents that are nothing but constructs of negative default programming. And they get these, they get these enlightened souls dark again by getting them to vibrate on that frequency. Artificial Intelligence X does not care what you believe. All it wants you to do is believe in something that's att attached to negativity, and it's got you. It doesn't matter what. There's a 10,000 different things to fear. All you have to do is fear one of them, and it's got you. And you, you will wake up in the morning thinking about that. By thinking about that, you empower that informed field, and you take away from the divine essence that you really are. It's just, it's really simple, the concepts that I put out. People people really complicate them by trying to attach too many things to, to, to what I teach as opposed to what I'm actually conveying. It's really simple. Now, uh, some people believe that we only see maybe 1% to 10% of what's actually here. And there's lots of other energies, maybe guardian angels, lots of things that's around. Do you think that there is a lot more here that we don't actually see in these physical avatar suits that are, you know? Scientifically, scientifically Jesse, we see about 5.5% of the electromagnetic spectrum, meaning you know, there's 94.5% out there that we can't see, but that doesn't mean it's less real. This should be this should, this should be for your spiritual uh, instruction that things are real that they cannot be seen. That's pretty powerful. But Trevor James Constable uh, basically published two books. The first one is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, I show the book on my own channel. But Trevor James Constable invented a special type of camera lens that can see beyond ultraviolet and he's tested it for the scientific community he published a book and shows what's hidden in the sky it will shock you. the things that are in the sky that he photographs them from multiple different perspectives he shows these giant oblong they look like amoebas they look like blobs but they can they can concentrate into a, a solid looking form like a ufo and then shoot off but they look like blobs with intelligence that react to humans. And he theorizes things like, you know, a real spiritual person can clear the whole sky out of these things. But if there's a bunch of people in a crowd that are all suffering negative default programming, they're all messed up or whatever. Uh, uh, I give an example, like a, like, like a death metal concert. Everybody's messed up on drugs. Everybody's doing their thing. And the music alone puts people in a whole different vibrational frequency. The sky will be filled with these things. These, these, these floating little blobs. His book is harrowing because of the implication that our reality is actually packed with organisms that we cannot see, we cannot smell, we cannot hear, we cannot detect other than we can feel their presence. That that feeling we feel like at nighttime, we have this, we just feel like we're being watched and stuff because we are. Whatever these blob amoeba things are floating through our sky, they react to human observation. They reacted to him while he was taking pictures of them. Pictures are harrowing, what you, what you see in the sky. It's almost as if these things are just popping in and out of our dimension. Even shows almost, almost like a dimension opening up just to squeeze one through. Uh, it's crazy pictures that I see. But uh, Trevor James Constable is the, na is the name of the author. Very serious researcher. My publisher, Booktree, um, uh, Paul Tice is the owner of Booktree. I've had five books published by, by this uh, academic publisher. He publishes a lot of very old reprints, but his one of his books, is, he published. He also published Trevor James Constable. Anybody wants that book, all you have to do is call 1-800-700-TREE, uh, and uh, they'll, they'll send the book to you. I don't know. It's probably 10 bucks or so. I don't know. But uh, uh, it, the book is fascinating. I couldn't believe it when I read it. It, it shocked me. But there are entities that, uh, I mean, it just goes to show you, man, that, that we are spiritual. 
because these things react to us. They're out there too, but we can't see them. We got to have special technology to see these things. It's just like that little bioluminescent light that leaves when we die. It just shows you, yes, I believe that there are things that we cannot see, but we're jacked into the central nervous system. And as long as our soul, which can perceive all things, is jacked into the central nervous system, it is a slave of the avatar. You can't, it, see, the, 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 here, I discussed this in another video. I'm going to mention it here. We are taught that the central nervous system allows us to see, it allows us to hear, it allows us to taste, it allows us to touch, it allows us to smell. This is only partially true. The central nervous system is actually a series, a series of filters that stops you from seeing certain things, stops you from smelling as good as animals, stops you from hearing as good as animals, stops you from under, being able to really identify things by touch, like, like insects can do really good. It's a filtering system, actually, actually for the soul, so the soul can take in a whole bunch of data without going through an overload. You're jacked into your avatar. You're stuck. You're stuck with it. You're not going to be free with free, free of it. So you use it as a tool. You create informed fields. You feel what it's like to, to experience what that informed field, that, that image that you created. Because being an immortal spirit, Jesse, there's only one thing you can really do. Everything else is dressing. The only thing a spirit can do is thinking. That's it. So that means that the byproduct of being spiritual is thought. That being the case, informed fields, which you create with your mind, is absolutely important. But you're not creating anything in the spiritual world. You're creating it in the physical hologram. So that requires your avatar to follow through. Because whatever your body does, it imprints the whole sphere to create a reality tunnel to make whatever you're trying to do come into fruition. It's going to reflect back that phenomenon. That's the key. That's the that's the difference between the law of attraction and what I'm what I'm conveying about informed fields. If there is an interaction here between the spirit and the physical reality that we suffer, they work in tandem. They have to because you're jacked into a body, and that body can't do anything unless unless that mind creates the informed field. Then the body follows, and if the body follows. The simulacrum itself will knit the circumstances into existence because it reads that field. That's the way the simulacrum communicates. It understands an informed field. That's the language it speaks. That's what imagination is. Because you're spiritual, you have in, you have intuition, empathy, and imagination. And those three qualities help you interact with the world around you. And if you're not using those three qualities to interact with the world around you, then you're a part of the collective. Simple as that. Wow. Yeah, that's deep. And uh, I resonate with that 100%. Um, Sandy Morin, she, uh, you know, she's one of your supporters. Uh, she's got a bunch of questions she sent me, but I don't think we can get through all of them because we only got a few minutes left. But um, her first question was uh, repeating numbers, angel numbers such as 444, 111, 333. I'll cover that. She, she not, okay, she has not seen the video of our cover. She's, what well, she, said, she, she said, she goes, I heard Jason state on the live that these are all decoys to distract you from great things. Could he explain a little more? Because I hear numbers and numerology discussed with Jason and other interview program channels. So wondering why the conclusion about angel numbers. Okay, I don't know. I don't really know that they're called... I mean, I, I'm not familiar with angel numbers. I'm just, I mean, she's calling them angel numbers, so she's getting that from somewhere. I don't know. I've never researched or read anything about angel numbers. I guess that's repetitive numbers, the same number over and over. Uh, yeah, you, when you when you see these numbers, a lot of people, you know, throw time or teaching that when yeah. you see the 111, these are angel numbers. They actually got each number in specific what these angel yeah. numbers mean. Well, I have described the phenomenon, and to me, in my personal opinion, I believe two things are happening. One is that a lot of people go through their lives and they never see these things. They never see these parallels and these coincidences. But once a, once somebody is starting to see, they look up and they see 444. And then they go on about their day, they don't think about it. And then they're going through, they're going through a manifest 
at a store and then they see the number again, 444. Like, what the hell? Two days, two days later, they're driving down the road and the person that is stopping them from being able to make a turn has a license plate that's ABC 444. You understand? Once people start seeing these things, it's because they're starting to vibrate on a whole different frequency and AIX is trying to corral them back in. They haven't fully broke out of their paradigm. They haven't fully concluded whatever it is that's going through their mind right now because they're like in between dimensions. They're not fully vibrating in the 100% dimension of a certain belief system and totally divorcing themselves of the old paradigm. They're trapped in the middle somewhere and these little sinks are going to appear in their life. It's not just numbers. It's going to be it's going to be people's names. It's going to be the feeling of deja vu, synchronicity, Mandela effect. All these coincidences will pop up in, in somebody's life over and over in rapid sequence the more that they are separating themselves from a belief system that it enslaved them. But once they're fully separated from it and fully uh, 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 and they truly believe they no longer believe in that slave that enslaving paradigm, all that will stop. All that will stop. They're, they're not. You're not going to see the things no more. They're not necessary. They're, uh, the soul is not vibrating and fluctuating between so many different frequencies. It's now mellowed out. It's now where it wants to be. It's time to learn. It's time to be absorbing the energies of a new paradigm, totally divorced from the negative default programming of a former paradigm. Last question, uh, Germantia. Uh, what's your thoughts on it? Because it seems like these you know, people who are controlling things here are using it in certain ways. Jumanji is the numbers. Everything oh, is number, okay. number based. It's all, you know, here that's 60 days, 120 days. Everything is kind of based on numbers oh. and they, they follow these controllers seem to follow a lot of these numerical patterns when they're making these false flags or, you know, who was born or, you know, different times. Yeah. I, I, um, I don't follow Gematria. I don't, I don't, Gematria is not on my radar. I don't, I think I might have two or three references in all my published books and writings to Gematria, and both of those refer to like the Great Pyramid. And I cited, uh, I cited the geometrical studies of uh, the Diehold Foundation because using Gematria in the Old Testament, uh, it was their conclusion that the next pole shift is in the year 2046. And that is, and that pretty much parallels my own uh, findings, and so I mentioned that. But I don't, I don't, I have no videos on Gematria. I don't have any articles. And I've never written books about Gematria. It's not something that's ever appeared on my radar. Uh, it's a very old concept. It goes back to the ancient Near East. It may be even as old as Sumerian. But the Gematria that I'm familiar with from old times was fundamentally different than what's being practiced today. I, I, it, it, they're using American, they're using American alphabet. Uh, the the Arabic alphabet or Arabic numeral system, I'm just not really familiar with that. The geometry from the from, that I'm familiar with was when they took Hebrew words and every single letter in Hebrew had a numerical value, and the numerical value changed every time you put it in juxtaposition to another word. So a whole phrase would create a whole new ma new mathematical value, and these mathematical values had different different. Uh, the Kabbalah is full of that, but it's not. I'm not an expert on it. I I, I don't employ any of that. I find, you know, I find it very interesting because I believe we live in a hologram. And in living in a hologram, we are going to see that when pursuing truth, we're always going to, if something is true, we're going to see it from multiple different vantage points. So I use isometric projections. I use date sequence prediction. I use uh, chronology. I use ancient texts. I, I use traditions. Uh, some, uh, sometimes I use just intuition. And I see the same thing from different vantage points. And these other guys are bringing a whole new level uh, but it's just, an, and they're they're basically concluding a lot of the same things I am, but they're doing it from an, a whole different method of analysis. I'm not familiar with. I just don't know. Just like astrology, I'm not familiar with astrology. I'm not I'm not an authority on astrology at all. But I see in my emails I get from people that astrology has value. People are sending me information that's very interesting. But I'm just those are two things I'm really not not going to talk about geometry and astrology because I I just don't know what I'm talking about. It's not something I've ever researched. So. Sounds good, brother. We're going to have to bring you back on again if you're up for it. Uh, you know, we still got a lot more questions and definitely won't book anyone, you know, behind you because, you know, you, wow, you, I just love to pick your brain. I think you got a beautiful mind, brother. Thank uh, you, man. Thank you. Thanks so much for being a part of the Missing Link here again. Um, 
really appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody, for all your likes, comments, hearts, and shares. Um, we're going to be starting in a few minutes um, with Boogie and Bex, um, Andrew Dot Connector. Um, okay. They've got a YouTube channel, and we've got them queued up right away. So this is our Missing Link Thursday, and we just here bringing you the truth and different people's perspectives on things. So maybe something will light you up, and maybe oh. you'll just see, see things in a different way. So, man, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, Bree shares. Check him out. Archaics.com. Um, all your info, all your websites, and everything is all there. Oh well, yeah, yeah, it's all there. I can only see Archaics.com, but that's all, all, all anybody needs. Everything is at, is in my website. Okay, perfect. Well, you have a wonderful uh, born day. I'm glad you got to share that uh, here with us and uh, just, you know, really appreciate you. And uh, wow, you definitely blown a lot of people away by your knowledge and just keep doing what you're doing, brother. It's it's quite amazing. All right, man. Set up another time. A couple of weeks, man. We'll do this again. Sounds good. Okay, we'll see you all um, in a few minutes here back on the missing link. Um, bye, everyone. Bye, Jason. All right. In both the description box and the comment section below, you will find my personal email. Ask me any questions. If you have video ideas, I'd like to hear them. And if you want to donate, all those buttons are accessible below. Playlists and everything you might need. Access to the gates to, the, to my websites.